Good afternoon, everyone, and please be seated for those of you who are present. Welcome to our 2021 public hearing on civil legal services in New York. Joining me today in person are the leaders of the judiciary and the legal profession in New York State, and it's my privilege to introduce them to you, starting with the chief administrative judge of the courts, Lawrence K. Marks, to the far right. Presiding Justices of the Appellate Division, First Department, Rolando Acosta. The Second Department, our most recently appointed Presiding Justice, Hector LaSalle. Presiding Justice of the Appellate Division, Third Department, Elizabeth Gary. And Presiding Justice of the Appellate Division, Fourth Department, Gerald Whelan. And we also have, as is our tradition and our model, the President of the New York State Bar Association, T. Andrew Brown who leads the largest voluntary bar association in the country and is a most important partner in our collective efforts to close the justice gap. And while once again this year's public hearing will be conducted in a hybrid fashion, the presence in person of the leaders of the judiciary and the state bar we hope underscores for all of you our deep commitment to the institution and the issues of access to justice and to supporting the civil legal service and pro bono providers who are working on the front line in the face of many, many extraordinary challenges presented by the pandemic. Before we begin hearing from our presenters today, I do want to express on behalf of all of us our gratitude and appreciation to Helene Barnett, the absolutely incomparable chair of the Permanent Commission, her foresight and inspiring leadership and service over so many years in guiding our collective efforts, both at the federal and the state level, has been simply extraordinary. Thank you, Helene, for your service. to extend our deepest thanks and appreciation to the 32 members of the Permanent Commission for their unfailing dedication, particularly over the last 18 months. Notwithstanding all of the disruption and the change that's been caused by the pandemic, the Commission has never faulted in its mission, organizing our hybrid public hearing last year and this year advancing our issues by convening our technology conferences and our stakeholder meetings, offering free webinars for legal service providers on how to make effective use of remote technology, highlighting and sharing and expanding innovative access to justice solutions in response to the pandemic, and importantly, surveying clients of legal service providers to learn about and from them over the, of their experiences in our virtual courts. I think we'll all agree that it's been strong, proactive work guided by a strong, motivated membership. And there is a commission member present in this courtroom today who deserves special mention. Edwina Mendelson, who is our Deputy Chief Administrative Judge for Justice Initiatives, has done an absolutely outstanding job working on multiple fronts and with multiple justice partners to help us bridge the digital divide and to ensure meaningful, meaningful access to our virtual courts during this pandemic. So thank you, Judge Mendelson, and thank you for being present today. Finally, 
We are keenly and fully aware that the Commission relies on outstanding staff to carry out its mission so effectively, and we have three members from the Order of Office of Court Administration who I, we would like to highlight and, and thank for their service, Barbara Muley, Rochelle Klempner, and Barbara Zeller-Gringer. And what can we say about the magnificent support of Sullivan and Cromwell? The Commission is so very fortunate to benefit from their outstanding and generous pro bono support. And there is a special thanks from us to the firm for lending us Jessica Klein and Alana Longmore, and of course to Bob Jufra, as always, an active and interested partner in all of our initiatives. Finally, as part of today's public hearing, our 12th, we'll hear oral presentations and receive into the record written statements from many of our experienced and knowledgeable individuals and organizations. That information and data will uh, help us to, along with the Commission's uh, research and observation, will help us to prevent our findings in our mandated Chief Judge's report to the Governor and the legislature on the state of affairs and will help us with our funding and programmatic decisions. We are fortunate today to have a very diverse group of experts to present to us and they will be presenting on the topics that are of enormous moment at this time. The legal needs of the large numbers of tenants facing eviction the importance of bridging the digital divide for litigants seeking access to our virtual courts, and how the disparate impact of the pandemic on, uh, has affected communities of color, and how that underscores why the access to justice crisis is in so many vital respects a racial and equal justice crisis of that affecting the legitimacy of our system. And of course, uh, this afternoon, in the latter part of this afternoon, we will hear the voices and experiences from our clients who are all committed to serve and make certain that access to justice is at a maximum. And we are grateful and appreciative to each of them for having the courage to come forward and share their intimate stories and their uh, personal experiences. So, before we get to the substantive portion, one final matter of housekeeping to ensure that our hearing proceeds smoothly and that we're being respectful of everyone's time. For our virtual presenters, and I see our first presenter waiting very patiently <laughs> for us to begin. When it's your turn to speak, I wanna remind you that our IT staff will be transferring you from our virtual waiting room into our virtual hearing room, and that might take a few seconds. I also wanna remind you to turn on your video and unmute your microphone. Uh, and uh, once you're in the hearing room, I'll briefly introduce you. You'll present your statement, and I hope you are amenable to our panel uh, teasing out perhaps a little more information on things of interest to them. We've asked each pre presenter to limit their times. You will see right in front of me is uh, the evidence of our notorious Court of Appeals timekeeping system. There's a red light and a white light. The white light will go on. That signals you have about a minute left to wind down your comments and the Red light, unfortunately, means that your time has expired. We ask everyone to be very respectful of the time. So now, moving to the substantive portion of our hearing, our first presenter is Darren Walker, president of the Ford Foundation. Mr. Walker runs a leading, the leading international philanthropy focused on fighting inequality in all of its forms. He, Mr. Walker recently received the Wall Street Journal's Philanthropy Innovative Award in 2020. After the Ford Foundation, and this is stunning each time that I think about this and read about it, issued a first of its kind $1 billion social bond in the capital markets to support local nonprofits 
hit hard by COVID-19. Mr. Walker has enjoyed a most distinguished professional career, and we look forward to hearing, sir, your insights and your recommendations. Thank you for taking the time to be with us today. Mr. Walker. Good afternoon, Chief Judge DeFiore, President, Presiding Justices Acosta, LaSalle, Gary, Whalen, Chief Administrative Judge Marks, and New York State Bar President, Mr. Brown. Thank you for convening this urgent conversation and thank you for your visionary leadership and your sustained commitment to New Yorkers, especially those New Yorkers who are low income. As president of a foundation that is headquartered in New York and a foundation that is committed to reducing inequality and inequity in the world, I am truly honored to be a part of today's presentations. Now, each of us shares a strong, powerful love for New York, and yet each of us is intimately familiar with the inequalities and inequity that exists in our great state. And we know that these inequalities and inequities have only deepened throughout this pandemic. So New Yorkers who already lacked access to health care now face the highest risk of COVID-19. New Yorkers who are already stretched to make unaffordable rents face the threat of looming eviction. And as all of you know, and many know better than most, the criminalization of poverty presents a pressing threat to justice. Even before the pandemic, poor families were 22 times more likely to be involved in the family court system than their wealthier counterparts. And these rippling disparities impact the experiences of New Yorkers who engage our civil justice systems in countless, often invisible ways. I'd like to call attention to something I am particularly passionate about, and that is access to technology. Access to technology is one important example of the ways in which inequality manifests in our justice system. Now, to some, it may seem immaterial to talk about the digital divide alongside the many visceral, visceral realities of poverty, hunger, displacement, and family separation, to name a few. But according to our partners at the Bronx Defenders, these disparities in access to technology can end up sending more people to prison. And that's because clients without internet cannot attend pre-trial meetings, access social services supports, programming, communicate with their lawyers over video, and even get basic and crucial information about their proceedings. We need to fund infrastructure, especially technologies, to bridge the digital divide and allow access to justice for all New Yorkers. And because of the structural reality of racism in our justice system, this isn't just about access, it's about racial equity. Black, brown, and poor New Yorkers are impacted disproportionately and simply for their circumstances and their core identities. To confront the compounding challenges of the pandemic, poverty, and persistent racism, we believe that government and philanthropy must be bigger, bolder, and more innovative than we've ever been before. In a time where many want a return to normal, we need to reject calls to decrease support for civil legal services, and instead, let's recommit ourselves and our resources for this critically important work. Because in supporting these services, we support the foundations of a more just, a more equal New York, and a more accessible, equitable justice system. And that's why the hearings you have called here today are so very important. We have an opportunity to center our solutions around the people who are closest to the challenge. And I believe that foundations can play a critical role in supporting this work. As funders, we have the resources to experiment, the agility to take risks, 
and the platform to break through old constraints towards new possibilities. But foundations cannot take the place of government. Let me say it again. Foundations and private philanthropy cannot take the place of government. But we can work together creatively, experimentally. One example is the work that we are doing with the Bronx Defenders, who are activating a network of community groups and government institutions to distribute affordable cell phone plans to New Yorkers experiencing homelessness. Or we could talk about our $100 million commitment to the Justice and Mobility Fund, which invests in wide-scale efforts to boost economic, mobility, and life outcomes for justice-involved New Yorkers. One in three American adults has a criminal record. And as a result of the misguided, I believe, misguided tough on crime era laws, they face major barriers to employment, leading to cycles of recidivism that are rooted in poverty. In fact, up to 50% of people with the criminal record lost their job during this pandemic. And so in collaboration with formerly incarcerated activists, advocacy groups, and partners in the philanthropy community, government and philanthropy should support holistic services for returning citizens to break the cycles of poverty and ensure better outcomes. To quote my friend Brian Stevenson, the opposite of poverty is not wealth. The opposite of poverty is justice. The pursuit of justice, true justice for all New Yorkers, is what brings us here today. We are so grateful for your visionary leadership and the opportunity that you've given us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Walker. Uh, Mr. Walker, first of all, thank you for the work you lead at the Ford Foundation on behalf of all of us. And I think you would find that we all do agree to your concept about working collaboratively. He, and, and of course, uh, to the notion that foundations can play a critical role, but they can't take the place of government. We are first and foremost responsible in our own space. But let me ask you this, sir. How should we as leaders of the New York State court system, the justice system, what should we be doing to encourage greater support from folks who are similarly situated to you, who can move the need, help us move the needle in important ways. Are there certain strategies that we can use to approach folks in positions of importance? What, what would you suggest we think about? Thank you very much for that question. I believe that there is tremendous interest in philanthropy, in addressing issues of access to justice. And I believe that uh, the court system itself could be better organized. It could, be, it could organize in a way that created a mechanism for working in partnership with government. So one example might be to create a, an office of philanthropy or to task a high level official in the system with being a liaison to organized philanthropy. Uh, for example, there is a national organization that I was a co-founder of that has brought together what is now over 30 uh, large foundations, high net worth families that represents billions of dollars in assets who are investing in uh, the criminal justice and the civil justice systems. So I do believe that there are, are, are proactive things that you could do, and certainly we here at the Ford Foundation would be delighted to work with you in partnership. We will take you up uh, on that very generous offer, sir. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Walker? Honorable Chief, if, if yes. I may. Chief. Yes, Mr. Brown. Uh, Mr. Walker, uh, let me also commend you and the foundation for uh, your contributions uh, over the past many years, which has been of a significant magnitude. One of the things that you mentioned, and part of your comments to, to the chief just now spoke to this, uh, you indicated that philanthropy and government must work 
together uh, more going forward. Are there, are there specific obstacles that you think have been in the way in the past to, to, to that? And are there uh, things that you see now that can help uh, address some of those obstacles? And, and more importantly, uh, as speaking on behalf of the New York State Bar Association, is there anything that you see an association such as ours can do to facilitate better workings between philanthropy and the government going forward? Well, Mr. Brown, as you probably know, the New York State Bar is the leading, most innovative uh, and entrepreneurial bar in the, in the country. And there have been many, many uh, positive uh, and constructive contributions through partnership with the private sector and government um, and law firms um, that, that your organization has led, that the Ford Foundation over our history has participated in. I don't believe there are necessarily obstacles or formal barriers. I believe that uh, we have not uh, looked at the opportunities to leverage uh, as affirmatively uh, as we could. And I, I just simply would offer that um, those opportunities exist. And one of the exciting things I see in philanthropy, especially among younger philanthropists, is they are committed to justice issues. They are more likely and more comfortable to engage on issues of racial justice, uh, of inequality, uh, than older uh, philanthropists. So I believe that now is a right time to engage. And uh, again, the Ford Foundation uh, stands ready to serve. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. I, Justice Acosta. I, I, I thought I heard a more expansive definition of what constitutes infrastructure. Uh, I know that traditionally we have looked at infrastructure, uh, particularly in the funding of civil legal services, only to include other than personnel services. Uh, is that something that, I mean, I had not heard that before. Generally, you think of infrastructure as a very limited uh, thing. I mean, universal pre-K, uh, I think developing leadership that's more inclusive and diverse can constitute infrastructure. Uh, am I redefining infrastructure now? No, Judge Acosta. We believe infrastructure uh, constitutes what you have described and more. We believe that in a system of justice, infrastructure must include uh, the, uh, the, the social infrastructure, the systems that support uh, healthy families, healthy communities, um, and a healthy economy. And so infrastructure is most certainly the human capital, uh, the physical uh, infrastructure, um, and beyond. All of this uh, is necessary and essential to a healthy functioning democracy at which uh, our justice, uh, justice system sits at the center. Thank you. Anyone else? Mr. Walker, we thank you for taking the time to uh, present to us, and your testimony has been very enlightening and powerful, and we will be taking you up on your offer to perhaps uh, engage in a session or two with us to think about how we should strategize going forward. So thank you very much, sir. Thank you, I look forward to it. Thank you. Okay, our next presenter is Doug Wankler, General Counsel and Executive President for Pfizer. We'll take a moment for Mr. Wankler to enter our virtual hearing room. I'm hoping you can see and hear me. I can see you and hear you. Can you see us and hear us? I, I can. I can. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Lankler. As I mentioned uh, just a moment ago, uh, Doug Lankler is general counsel and executive vice president at Pfizer. And in addition to all of the phenomenal work 
he has been leading at Pfizer. Mr. Lankler has had a distinguished career in the private practice of law and in fact in the United States Attorney's Office for the Southern District where he received the Attorney General's Distinguished Service Award, indeed a high honor. Uh, Mr. Lankler is also important to today's proceedings, one of the founding members of our New York State Business Council for Access to Justice, which was first announced at this public hearing last year. Mr. Lankler, we thank you for your participation and we look forward to your comments, sir. Thank you so much. Good afternoon, Chief Judge DeFiori, Justices Acosta, LaSalle, Gary, and Whalen. Chief Administration, Administrative Judge Marks and New York State Bar President Brown. It's my genuine honor to be with you today. Indeed, I'm sorry I'm not with you in person in Albany. I'm Doug Lankler, General Counsel and Executive Vice President of Pfizer. And while a global company, Pfizer is very much a New York company. Discovered in Brooklyn and with its headquarters in Manhattan, we have proudly been in the state for over 170 years. <clears throat> I'm here to discuss the important role that the business community, and in particular, the lawyers and legal professionals at New York-based companies can play to help low-income New Yorkers have access to much-needed civil legal services. In my view, the business community should take a leadership role in seeking to improve access to legal services for the underserved for one simple reason. It's the right thing to do. The business community can leverage its resources to help in two concrete ways. First, to mobilize volunteers to engage in pro bono work. And second, to provide philanthropic support to legal services organizations that work tirelessly to help New Yorkers in need. Our pro bono work is one of the most impactful ways that we can improve access to justice. And as corporate general counsels, in partnership with our outside law firms and legal services organizations, we have the ability to encourage our lawyers and legal professionals to get involved. I'm happy to say that at Pfizer, we have done just that. I'm immensely proud to be part of a company committed to helping the community and to lead a legal division that makes that a priority through a wide array of pro bono projects and yearly contributions to nonprofit organizations. Our commitment is deeply rooted in one of Pfizer's core company values, equity. We believe that every person deserves to be seen, heard, and cared for. And that goes beyond the workplace and healthcare delivery, which is why we have had a robust pro bono program for over two decades. It includes not only work by many Pfizer colleagues, but strategic partnerships with our partner law firms and with legal services organizations. Our program currently centers on three key areas, healthcare, racial justice, and COVID-19 assistance. In recent years, Pfizer colleagues have worked on election protection efforts to help historically disenfranchised communities of color, mentor under-resourced high school students who are considering careers in the law, and we've sponsored a range of medical legal fellowships, including a recent fellowship that will address racial disparities in healthcare. We spearheaded a monthly clinic for over a decade that helped nearly 2,000 cancer patients with a broad range of legal needs and helped individuals impacted by COVID-19 with housing, employment, and estate planning needs. We've helped veterans, immigrants, and many other New Yorkers in need of assistance. I'm also proud that Pfizer joined the New York State Business Council for Access to Justice, established by, Judge, by Chief Judge DeFiori almost a year ago. I want to take this opportunity to commend the Chief Judge for establishing the Council and to thank her sincerely for appointing me to serve as a member. The Council has made a difference and will continue to do so. In addition, I'd like to thank Business Council co-chairs Kim Harris, the General Counsel of NBC Universal, and Eric Grossman, the Chief Legal Officer of Morgan Stanley, for their strong leadership, and in particular for their leadership on an upcoming pro bono project that will marshal corporate legal departments and law firms to help low-income New Yorkers with housing cases. I should also note that I'd like to thank 
uh, Robert Fisk, who I'm proud to call a mentor and a friend for his leadership in this regard as well. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, many New Yorkers are behind on rent and at risk of losing their homes. As part of the Business Council's program, in-house legal departments will, among other things, partner with outside counsel to represent clients in eviction proceedings as those cases start to move forward and offer clinics to assist clients applying for emergency rental assistance. Pfizer looks forward to joining fellow New York corporations in supporting this important initiative. Giving back is not only the right thing to do, but it also helps improve corporate legal departments in a number of important ways. We found that colleagues who work on pro bono projects feel more connected to each other and to their com communities. Pro bono work offers opportunities for our attorneys and legal professionals to sharpen and broaden their skills. It also creates a sense of satisfaction about one's workplace, which is a very important tool in the recruitment and retention of talented and purpose-driven colleagues. And finally, we found that our volunteers simply find it deeply gratifying to help others in need. The work is genuinely its own reward. In addition to sponsoring important pro bono projects, corporations can and should provide philanthropic support to the public interest organizations that are on the front lines of providing legal assistance. We regularly contribute to and partner with New York-based and national organizations that are dedicated to providing pro bono assistance to low-income individuals and communities on issues related to healthcare, racial justice, COVID-related assistance, domestic violence, and other critical civil legal needs. I can list these organizations for you during the question session if you like. Uh, there are a long list of great organizations and we're very, very proud to get to partner with them. These organizations largely depend on donations from corporations, law firms, and others to continue their important work. The need for donations has become even greater during the pandemic as funding sources have narrowed and the need for free legal representation has continued to increase. At Pfizer, we know that corporations do not exist in a vacuum. We are part of a society, and as such, we have an affirmative obligation, I would genuinely call it a moral obligation, to give back and to improve the quality of life of the people in small and big ways. We believe that with privilege comes responsibility. We have the privilege to operate in a society, and in turn, we have a responsibility to those in need, making it a positive and potentially life-changing impact in this case, by providing vital legal assistance to underrepresented communities and individuals. I didn't come here today to merely recite a list of good things that Pfizer does. Uh, we do not see credit for doing what we're supposed to do. It's, of course, not about credit. Indeed, uh, I think we all believe we should all be doing more at Pfizer. This opportunity to speak with you today is a chance to underscore your call to action and an affirmative and, and an affirmation of the uniquely important role corporate America and the legal profession should play in solving this vexing problem. When Albert Borla, Pfizer's CEO, directed us to do everything possible to fight COVID-19 back in March of 2020 through the development of potential vaccines and treatments, he said to us at that time, if not us, who? He led us to realize our purpose, which is creating breakthroughs that change patients' lives by delivering a breakthrough vaccine. While that remains our core purpose, we, like all corporations, should think beyond that and about ways that we can use our extraordinary size and scale to positively impact lives in as many ways as possible. The luxury of merely, quote, doing what we do, end quote, does not exist. In that spirit, then, I say this to my fellow corporate counsels, indeed to the entire legal profession about speaking out and doing something to expand access to legal services for low-income families and individuals statewide. If not us, who? Thank you, Chief Judge DeFiore and distinguished members of this panel for the opportunity and the privilege of being with you today. Thank you, Mr. Lankler, and thanks for your service on the Business Council and, of course, the leadership of Kim Harris and Eric Grossman. You know, you, you really struck a chord, I believe, with all of us when you spoke about you, one should not seek credit for the things you're supposed to do. 
we should try to extend that notion beyond the things we're supposed to do. But it is a busy and complicated world, particularly over these past 18 months when needs are exacerbated. I asked a similar question to Mr. Walker before you. What is it that we can do strategically to better engage general counsel at firms like yours to become more active and proactive? I, 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 I genuinely think you're doing it, uh, Chief Judge, uh, by, by doing things like these kinds of hearings and um, the business counsel. For me, uh, getting an invitation uh, to that group from you um, was very important, and it was important to my company. It was important to my law division. Um, we take pride in that, and it's a great, great group of people. It's the kind of people that you want to get to work with and learn from. Um, we watch with great admiration a lot of companies and the great work that they do in the pro, no, pro bono uh, sector, uh, and we learn from them, and we get great ideas, and we're able to partner with them. So creating that kind of community in the uh, business dynamic is tremendously important. It incentivizes all of us to step up. It makes you want to do the right thing. At Pfizer, we're proud of our company, and we want to show up well. Uh, and uh, in addition to the number of different incentives that we already have for being in this space, um, that's a big one for us, and, and we take it seriously. And, and I assume, and I ho would hope that we would hear from you that the current members are incentivized to leverage their membership to attract more interest in sharing the word. Thank no you. question. I, I, I think um, in the group that you've got, you have a collection of companies that have always taken pro bono very seriously. Uh, with Kim and Eric's leadership, um, there's, there's genuine strategy there and drive, and it allows us to kind of come together behind projects like low-income housing, which are incredibly important, uh, and, and really drive our collective resources towards sometimes specific needs, which is a really, really terrific approach. Outstanding. Thank you. Anyone? Any questions? Thank you so very much, Mr. Langler. And on behalf of all of us in the unified court system, our gratitude and appreciation is extended to Pfizer and the leadership there for taking the lead and keep, helping to keep America safe. Thank you. Thank you. Here is Judge Jean Schneider who is our citywide supervising judge of the New York City Housing Court, a court which is obviously in the eye of the storm right now. Judge Snyder has decades, thankfully, as a housing court judge and civil legal services attorney, and we are grateful, grateful to her for outlining today the challenges that lie ahead for the many litigants seeking services in housing court and for her extraordinary service not only across her tenure as a housing court judge, but particularly over the past 18 months. Thank you, Judge Snyder. Thank you, Judge DeFiori. Uh, Chief Judge DeFiori, presiding justices, Acosta, LaSalle, Gary, <coughs> and Whalen, uh, Chief Administrative Judge Marks, uh, and President Brown, uh, good afternoon, and thank you very much for inviting me to participate in this event today. Uh, I want to take a few moments this afternoon to highlight for you uh, the ways in which the housing court has been affected by COVID-19 uh, and the key role, the essential role, that the availability of civil legal services for tenants in our court has played during this extremely difficult period. Uh, for most of the last 18 months, uh, most evictions in the state of New York have been forbidden either by administrative orders or by emergency laws of one kind or another. Um, these laws and orders reflect the judgment of the political branches of government uh, that during this crisis, which is both a public health crisis and an economic crisis, uh, eviction would inflict unacceptable damage, not just to the individuals evicted, 
but to the state as a whole, um, both by deepening the economic harm of the pandemic and by providing greater opportunities for viral spread. Uh, but this has not meant that the New York City Housing Court has stopped operating, far from it. Uh, in mid-pandemic, uh, New York City expanded the coverage of its right to counsel law. Before the pandemic, uh, that law was expanding slowly neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, the legal services providers that had contracts under that law were gradually hiring more lawyers and able to represent more folks. Uh, when the pandemic, uh, when it was clear, once it was clear that the pandemic was not going to go away quickly, the city council expanded the coverage of that law to everyone. That meant that we in the housing court had um, tens of thousands of pending cases in which tenants did not have lawyers, uh, but were now entitled to them. Um, what we have done is to focus our efforts um, in the first instance on connecting tenants to lawyers. We have created um, gateway parts, if you will, um, that in which the primary purpose is to connect with a previously unrepresented respondent in an eviction case uh, we make it possible for those respondents to appear uh, by video, by telephone, or in person, uh, depending on what their abilities and preferences are. Um, the petitioner's counsel appears virtually, um, and an assigned legal services provider appears also virtually. Uh, the legal services provider and the respondent who appears are introduced to one another, uh, exchange contact information and arrange to speak immediately following the court appearance. Um, if they're successful in making contact, uh, the legal services provider then submits a notice of appearance and we are able to move the case into one of our virtual resolution parts as a two attorney case. Um, the, uh, What we have found um, <clears throat> is that uh, even in cases um, in which the court is stayed from going forward, in other words, imagine a case in which the tenant is sued for non-payment of rent. We have um, appointed counsel, uh, counsel for the tenant. Counsel has arranged for the tenant to file a hardship application under state law and the court is prohibited from going forward with that case. Because the tenant has counsel, the case does not stop moving. There is nothing in the law that prevents a legal services lawyer and a lawyer representing a landlord petitioner from working on the case, from resolving issues, and we very, very frequently find that we take the case off our calendars, put it on an administrative hold, and the next thing that happens in the case is we receive a stipulation of settlement or a stipulation of discontinuance because the lawyers have been able to move the case forward. Uh, working in this way in the first eight months of 2021, with essentially no evictions taking place, we were able to dispose of more than 30,000 cases. Um, now, this is not an amount that in our pre-pandemic world would be extraordinary, but we think it is extraordinary now. Um, the, um, if those cases, if the tenants in those cases had not had counsel, the cases would simply have sat. Um, it might be that the tenant would figure out how to apply for emergency rental assistance. Uh, it might not. Um, the current moratorium, which affects most of those cases, runs until January 15th. Without counsel available to assist the tenant in reaching resolution, those cases would have sat until January the 15th of next year, and when they came back on our calendars, they, we would have been overwhelmed. Um, so we are 
extraordinarily grateful that we're fortunate enough to work in an environment where there is a right to counsel um, and where cases are able to move forward uh, because of that. Um, if you will permit me, let me pause to say that I believe that the courts around the state that handle eviction cases uh, would find uh, that they would benefit from an expansion of the availability of counsel for tenants facing eviction in the way that we have. Um, New York City's right to counsel has made the housing court a fairer and more balanced court. We understood that, we expected it. Um, but I think less expected um, was uh, the extent to which the availability of counsel for tenants in eviction cases has made the court more efficient and more effective. Uh, even uh, before the pandemic period, uh, we found that um, the availability of counsel helped issues to c become clear, be identified earlier. Applications for benefits were made with the assistance of counsel in a timely and thorough fashion. Uh, many cases were simpler to resolve when knowledgeable counsel was available to assess what was available to the clients. Um, and even where cases could not be settled, counsel on two sides were able to narrow issues and help design a way of moving the case forward. Um, so the, um, I want to say one thing about the digital divide. The availability of counsel has helped us um, to serve um, litigants who otherwise would have been, had great deal of difficulty getting access to our court. Um, it is, however, um, certainly the case, and I have to say that Conrad Johnson from Columbia Law School um, has opened my eyes to this. Um, we probably need to be more aware that there's another digital divide which makes it difficult for legal services lawyers to communicate effectively with their clients across a digital divide. Um, and that perhaps there's a need to focus on what kind of support is necessary there um, for the law firms providing civil legal services uh, to, to conduct attorney-client relationships in a, uh, in a successful fashion. Um, in my written submission, um, I address another issue close to my heart, which is the um, the need to reform the notarization laws in New York. I see my time is up, and I will ask you simply to look at that when you get a chance. So, so Judge, against the backdrop and context of the work that you've been doing, particularly over the last 18 months, what do you see at, uh, or suggest to this commission that we prioritize in terms of assisting you and your judges in uh, providing adequate, efficient, timely, quality justice services in your court? Um, I think that um, a couple of things are, we're, there are a couple of things that we're facing going forward. Um, we are beginning to conduct more court proceedings in the courthouse. Um, this brings back an issue that we've been able to avoid for 18 months. It's not, I wouldn't call it a silver lining exactly, but the, the, um, the issues of the adequacy or inadequacy of some of our physical spaces um, are coming back into the fore as we think about inviting more members of the public into the courthouse. Um, so that becomes an issue. I think we have learned uh, to use the virtual space pretty well, and I think that will help us shoehorn into our spaces, but not entirely. Um, I also think that um, as we expand the work that we're doing, um, we're aware of, um, I think that, that we're really aware that we're stretching our legal services providers. We're really depending upon them, um, and we know that they need support and resources. The city has lots and lots of funding for them, um, but uh, there is hiring and training and supervising and so on. And we are trying to walk softly there 
in terms of what they are able to do in terms of their expansion. Um, and I think that, um, so the, we are also um, calling upon our non-judicial staff um, to do a lot of things that they never had to do before um, in terms of managing teams' invitations and, and doing things in bulk that uh, they've never had to do before. So we have clerks who are proud of their 30 years of expert service who are starting from scratch, and we're trying very hard to support them as well. Thank you. Thank you. Questions for Judge Snyder? Justice LaSalle. Your Honor, you touched on this at the end of your remarks. In your submitted materials, um, you referenced the in-person requirement uh, for those seeking to have documents notarized. Um, I mean, can the rule, you, you indicate this rule has created additional burden on parties in your court, and while we certainly aren't legislators, uh, I'd be curious with the Chief Judge's indulgence to hear about how you would envision this rule. How, how would you envision this rule evolve uh, to lessen obstacles for people in your court, while, while at the same time ensuring the, the reliability in person, uh, this in-person requirement has given us uh, through the years? The, the court system actually has had, as part of its legislative agenda for a number of years, uh, a proposal that New York State um, adopt a system more like the federal system where um, a litigant can make a declaration under penalty of perjury um, without appearing before a notary uh, in person in order to get the notary to stamp things. During the pandemic, this just became writ large for us. We had, um, we had uh, respondents who either had been illegally locked out of, a, of an apartment or had emergency conditions that needed to be addressed with repair um, and who literally would, would have been in those early days risking their lives to travel out to find a notary to, uh, before whom they could swear their petitions. Um, I will confess to you, although I'm afraid to do so in this august, august room, uh, that we may have um, cheated a little bit on some of those in terms of how we were trying to do it. But as we reopened and had to reinstitute those rules, we realized exactly how burdensome they were. And we heard from some of our upstate colleagues that they were even more burdensome in places where tenants had to travel long distances to find a notary. Um, it seems as though the federal system has survived on the declaration uh, for many years without an explosion of perjury. And we, I, I certainly believe that that would be a major step toward access to justice for many of our litigants. Thank you, Judge. Anyone else? Judge Marks. Uh, Gene Schneider, you, you described, um, I, I guess, like how it, it's sort of been a game changer in the New York City Housing Court to have attorneys on both sides of the case uh, going into these resolution parts, and, and I think you said 30-some 30, 30 thousand cases have been resolved as a result of that. Um, and we don't have the luxury of an attorney for every tenant who can't afford an attorney outside of New York City, but could you explain, is the, the, the court's uh, effort to resolve the case in, in a part like the a resolution part why can't that be effective in cases where there, uh, there is no attorney representing the tenant? What, what's the, um, um, why is that so difficult? When it's, there it's not that it can't be done. Um, it's that it is more challenging. I mean, one of the things that we've found with uh, remote appearances, for example, is that the, um, <clears throat> even with litigants who are able to appear by telephone or by video, um, the, the process of communication between a judge and an unrepresented tenant, in our case, um, is, it's a challenging communication anyway to explain thoroughly what the options are in the case um, and to be sure that you've got a litigant before you who understands the option and who is making a, a knowing choice. Um, on the video platform in which 
the judge, I include myself here, um, is learning new communication skills and is perhaps not quite as comfortable as she was in the courtroom. Um, and the litigant is also struggling with what may be um, difficult technology. It's just a more difficult challenge. Um, so that having the attorney um, to mediate has been excellent. The other thing that we've found is that, and this is pre-pandemic, pre, um, the value of having the um, attorney. Um, our, our, we did have um, a significant increase in pre-trial motion practice coming, from, coming in cases where there were lawyers. You would expect that. Um, but what we had was an even greater drop off in the motion practice after settlement. In other words, when a litigant without a lawyer settles the case, um, there is frequently the need by that litigant to revisit it and to say, wait a minute, I need to make an adjustment here, or wait a minute, I need more time for this. When an attorney settles the case, it seems to stay settled better. Um, and I think that that's been really um, a really significant thing that we didn't really expect. Thank you, Judge. Mr. Yeah, uh, Judge Snyder, uh, I know that last summer the housing court adopted NICEF. Yes. And the administrative board was more than happy to, although some of us were somewhat reluctant given the, the, the digital divide. Uh, how can we be more helpful to make NICEF more accessible to underrepresented litigants? Thank you for the question. NICEF obviously is a statewide system that was not designed for litigants without lawyers. Um, I know lawyers using it for the first time who have struggled mightily to learn it. Um, I think that um, if it's possible, I would love to see us work on um, making NICEF more user friendly um, making it, making more of its materials um, accessible in plain language. Um, and there are some other challenges. We have, for example, a large number of um, fillable forms that are available on our website um, provided through um, Justice Mendelssohn's um, operation. Those forms should be able to be filled out electronically and filed on NICEF. Right now, they cannot be. Right now, a litigant would have to fill out the forms, print them out, sign them in front of a notary, um, then scan them and upload them onto NICEF if they could figure out how to use the NICEF system. So we have some challenges there in terms of creating a more seamless environment um, through which litigants can use that system. Thank you, Judge Snyder. Thank you. Thank you very much for your time today. So our next speaker is Judge Kathy Davidson, Justice Kathy Davidson. She is currently serving as the Dean of the New York State Judicial Institute, our statewide center for judicial education and training. Prior to Judge Davidson's appointment to the deanship, she served as the administrative judge for the Ninth Judicial District, and under her leadership, the Ninth JD implemented many, many innovative reforms to improve the administration of justice and to expand access to justice. Justice Davidson, thank you for being here today. We look forward to hearing your presentation. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chief Judge Janet DeFiori, Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks, the Presiding Ju Justices Rolando Acosta, Hector LaSalle, Elizabeth Gary, Joe Day Whalen, and the New York State Bar President, T. Andrew Brown. Thank you for this opportunity to address the urgent need to provide civil legal services for low-income New Yorkers and other disenfranchised communities. The lack of civil legal services is a crisis that has been highlighted and emphasized by the pandemic. Over the last year and a half, leaders worldwide, such as yourselves, have participated in a campaign to address, protect, and find safe medical procedures, viable medical breakthroughs, miracles to fight COVID-19. In light of this global effort, I will frame my remarks from the viewpoint of what role does the court system have in building community? First, what is community building? 
Community building is defined as practices directed toward the creation or enhancement of community among individuals within a regional area or within a common need or interest. Our common need and interest today is this hearing to evaluate the continue, continuing unmet civil legal needs of low-income New Yorkers. The response is that we serve all communities in our courthouses every day. However, considering the local, national, and international changes in our world, we must play an even more significant role through innovative programs and outside-of-the-box thinking. Community network building will identify and address the needs of the communities we are highlighting here today and work towards solutions, enhancing the image and perception of the judiciary within our communities. The Faith-Based Court Access Program, FCA. The concept of the Faith-Based Court Access Program was born many years ago when our chief judge, Janet DeFiore, was the district attorney of Westchester County. As the DA, she worked with, with religious leaders to partner with other governmental agencies and hosted community events in our churches across the county. Building upon that idea, the FCA was designed to ensure that all communities, particularly the disadvantaged, can access the court even if they lack the technology to do so. At the height of the pandemic, we recognized that many litigants sought to access the court virtually, but due to the digital divide, they lacked the technology. Thus, we started this virtual project with the county executive of Westchester County, George Latimer, and five, five houses of worship promoting virtual equal access to courts for our communities. The mission of the FCA is to provide disadvantaged persons with remote access to the courts and to service providers while promoting equal access. The Houses of Worship offer safe haven space, electronic resources to log into court proceedings. Each location is equipped with a desk, office supplies, as well as a laptop, printer, scanner, donated by the Grace Baptist Church Foundation under the leadership of the Reverend Dr. Franklin Richardson. All essential PPE has been provided and safety measures are observed. On-site assistance is provided by trained FCA liaisons. The FCA also provides referrals for legal assistance in all areas of the law, including landlord-tenant, family law, surrogate, foreclosure, and immigration matters. The program has expanded to, Dutch to Dutchess County, Orange County, and the 9th Judicial District, and we have also assisted with opening of similar pilots in other judicial districts. Our model is being growing and being replicated throughout the state. Two, the Virtual Court Navigators Program. In 2019, the 9th the JD Access to Justice Family Court Subcommittee partnered with the Office of Justice Initiative to bring the Court Navigators Program to the Westchester County Courthouse. In-person navigators were placed in both Yonkers and White Plains locations to assist the public on how to access the court and obtain legal documents then the pandemic struck. To continue the use of navigators during the pandemic, we established a virtual court navigator pilot project. Designated court staff trained college students prepare for their role as navigators. The 9th JD team supervised virtu 10 virtual navigators who received college credits for their participation. Two, no two court navigators were assigned to act as liaison for the FCA program and the district's help center, which opened in the White Plains Courthouse during the, during the pandemic in May 2021. The program participants, many of whom were new to the judicial process, felt comfortable having a live person able to provide answers to their questions, even virtually. They all participated and appreciated the attention given to them by the navigators. This program is another example of community building by involving our students of local colleges, including their young people, in creating intergenerational connection for young minds on the importance of access to justice for all New Yorkers, regardless of their positions in life. Three, the Guardian at Lightning program. The GAL program is designed to provide access to those persons who are una unable to come to court or to represent their own in interests. The GAL, GAL program service serves litigants who have, one, not been declared judicially incompetent, two, are unable to represent themselves in court, three, have physical ailments that keep them from coming to court, or four, have some form of <coughs> mental illness which causes them to participate only, only sporadically. 
In those cases, a judge may appoint a GAL to act in that person's stead and to report their findings to the judge in all aspects of the case. It should be noted that the role of the GAL is very different from that of an attorney. A significant difference is that the GAL can help litigants access social services, can identify programs for litigants appearing before the court. The law that governs the GAL pro program charges local services departments, such as Adult Protective Services, APS, to provide those with services regardless of income to impaired adults who may be abused, neglected, or exploited, and in fact are living in our communities. The Westchester APS program is funded by the county and is another vehicle to provide protective services to our vulnerable population. This program gives APS a head start on cases before they accelerate out of control, thus avoiding crisis intervention. The GA program, GAL program is currently being rolled out with the training offered to judges, attorneys, lay GAL volunteers, and family members. The program will be ongoing and expected especially helpful in the area of landlord-tenant law. Special thanks to Fern Fisher, the New York State Bar Association, Access to Justice Initiative, Judge Walker, his team, Judge Keckner, Diane Atkins, and Deputy County Executive Ken Jenkins. In closing, and I think of building a community, I think of that childhood book, Charles Webb, which demonstrated change is something that we all expected and anticipate. But however, as we expand our legal web, these challenging times, we have brought hardship to our communities. The pandemic has inspired us to go beyond limits of our normal thinking. The spinning of a web as a metaphor of a community building is, this, is what these programs have accomplished. Despite difficult times, we have found ways to support the most vulnerable amongst us with new and inventive ideas and resources for our courts. Thank you, and a special thank you to Helene Barnett. Thank you, Dean. So, Dean, I know that you and I do agree that uh, faith leaders in our communities are akin to first responders, and uh, members of congregations turn to their faith leaders and use them as a source of referral and reference, and that, that's been great. My question to you is regarding the Court Navigators Program. Have you uh, expressed yourself any concern, or has there been any concern expressed in your community in the ninth? regarding the use of non-lawyers as a way to expand our access to justice? Not at all. And, and, and they don't provide the, the, the legal um, advice. They really are sort of more of assistance. I think it's one time when we had domestic violence um, victims come into court, there used to be someone who's to sit next to them when we have funding for that. And so I think it's, it, no one has expressed that, and actually I have 10 court navigators coming to meet me tomorrow, and we talk about it. So they are very clear in their role, and we have not had any concern uh, whatsoever in that area. Thank you. Any questions for Judge Davidson? Thank you, Dean, for appearing here today. Thank you, my Thank pleasure. Thank you very much. Our next presenter in person is... Judge Anne-Marie Jolly, our Deputy Administrative Judge for the New York City Family Court. Judge Jolly has devoted her entire professional career to serving the justice needs of New York's families and children. Welcome, Judge Jolly, and thank you for taking the time from what I know firsthand is a very busy schedule to appear here today. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity to discuss the current state and scope of the unmet needs for legal services by low-income New Yorkers confronting legal issues in the New York City Family Court. I particularly would like to acknowledge the panel, Chief Judge De Fiori, our Chief Administrative Judge Lawrence Marks, the presiding justices of the Appellate Division, Justice Gary, Justice Acosta, Justice LaSalle, and Justice Whalen, as well as the President of the New York State Bar Association. Mr. Brown, thank you so much for your time and attention to this critical issue. In a 2000 artic 2017 article published by the American Bar Association entitled Access to Justice, Mitigating the Justice Gap, Leonard Wills wrote, access to justice remains one of the fundamental principles of the rule of law. Access to justice consists of the ability of individuals to seek and obtain a remedy through formal or informal institutions of justice for grievances. And without legal assistance, 
litigants can struggle to navigate through the complexity of court procedures. An individual's failure to understand court proceedings and the substantive law-related issues of their case can lead to, lead to various things, including to the loss of their home, children, job, income, and liberty. Legal representation, as we all know, continues to remain expensive for most. This lack of affordability limits an individual's access to justice and contributes to what some refer to as the justice gap. In my capacity as both the Deputy Administrative Judge of the New York City Family Court and as the Chair of the New York State Advisory Committee on Attorneys for Children, I am a witness to that justice gap, particularly in child support and custody and visitation proceedings. The focus of my testimony will be to give you a sense of how the lack of available civil legal services most impacts particular court users and to support funding for the establishment and enhancement of meaningful civil legal services in order to close these gaps. While New York State does permit the family court to assign free attorneys to parties who cannot afford counsel in certain types of cases, the practical application of this entitlement still leaves many parties without counsel. This is most often due to the limitations on the types of cases that are statutorily recognized as counsel eligible, as well as a dearth of attorneys in family court who are available to accept court assignments. Family Court Act Section 262 is entitled Assignment of Counsels for Indigent Persons. It identifies the specific types of cases where a party has the right to have counsel assigned to them when she or he is financially unable to obtain the same. And Section 261 of the Family Court Act describes the legislative findings and the purpose behind the assignment of counsel provision in Section 262. And it specifically states in part, persons involved in certain family court proceedings may face the infringements of fundamental interests and rights and therefore have a constitutional right to counsel in such proceedings. Additionally, counsel is often indispensable to a practical realization of due process of law and may be helpful to the court in making reasoned determinations of fact and proper orders of disposition. Despite that legislative recognition of the value of counsel in support and paternity proceedings, it only specifies the right to have counsel assigned by the court to respondents in paternity proceedings and to respondents who are appearing in a hearing where a willful violation of a support order is alleged. These two scenarios make up only a small, small percentage of the support and paternity matters that are heard in our court. The majority of the support matters that are heard in the family court relate to the establishment or modification of an order of support. Accordingly, most of the parties in the support and paternity matters are not entitled to the assignment of counsel. And in fact, 2019 data from the Office of Court Administration indicates that over 90% of the parties appeared unrepresented in both case types. In our family court, the lack of entitlement to assign counsel in child support cases is particularly egregious since over my 30 years of working in the court, I have observed the majority of families involved with child support matters to be generally low, low income or poor, and they are persons of color. This observation is consistent with the findings of the Jay Johnson report from the Special Advisor on Equal Justice in the New York State Courts, which concluded that the majority of litigants appearing in family court are black and Latinx. When you consider these facts, the reality is that a significant number of impoverished persons of color are appearing in child support proceedings every day without the benefit of counsel. In 2019 alone, close to 74,000 support-related petitions were filed in the New York City Family Court. The lack of entitlement to counsel assigned, um, sorry, the lack of entitlement to court assigned counsel for a majority of these parties has negative impacts on both the parties and court administration and could be ameliorated with available qualified legal representation. Studies on the effect of high quality legal representation in family court reveals that the early appointment of qualified counsel in child welfare proceedings results in improved outcomes and more positive perception of court experiences. So extrapolating this to support and paternity matters only makes sense. It is easy to envision that the early assignment of counsel would have the potential to increase an otherwise reluctant, uncomfortable, and insecure party to continue their participation in a meaningful way in their support matters. In fact, a 2021 policy report from Her Justice reflects some of what we in the family court already anecdotally know. They found that when petitioners are represented by counsel, 
there was a reduction in both dismissals and adjournments due to the lack of service. They also found that there was a reduction in the number of adjournments due to lack of financial documentation, likely due to the fact that counsel was able to ensure their clients provide the court with the necessary documents. <clears throat> the production of these documents can be complicated, they can be overwhelming for many unrepresented court users. The reduction in the number of adjournments can be critical for both custodial and non-custodial parties who are living in poverty or are living with limited means as it minimizes time away from their jobs, um, uh, helping to avoid the erosion of their already limited financial resources. Another potential benefit from having counsel available to both parties is the reduced potential for default orders and the greater likelihood of more financially realistic support orders from the perspective of both parties. The effect of this would be a reduced need for subsequent modification and violation petitions, and accordingly, families would be spending less time in court litigating petition after petition and would therefore be spending less time away from their jobs and less money on childcare and transportation expenses to attend court appearances. The impact, the impact of this on the court is that jurists would have more reasonable calendars and could focus more attention and time on those matters that require more trial time. It is for these reasons that I strongly support measures to increase the availability of counsel on child support and paternity matters. Having counsel on custody matters likewise results in benefits for parties as well as court administration. Fortunately, Family Court Act Section 262 does provide um, court assigned counsel for both petitioners and respondents in these matters if they are deemed financially eligible. However, even when the court does determine that they are financially eligible, it's often difficult to find an attorney to assign. Over the course of the last several years, the New York City Family Court has seen a significant decrease in the number of attorneys on the first and second department's assigned counsel panels. As of August 2021, there was a total of only 300 attorneys available to accept court assignments on custody and visitation cases citywide. And this is just far too few attorneys for the thousands of cases which require the assignment of counsel. This, in fact, is a statewide concern since the third and fourth departments have also experienced a significant decrease in attorneys on their assigned counsel panels. The lack of qualified available attorneys has a compounding negative impact on the experience of litigants who are entitled to assigned counsel. The unavailability of attorneys to assign to the cases results in needless delays of cases and additional court appearance. Once assigned, the attorneys are often overbooked and they're not often able to appear on all their cases, which again cause delay. The lack of available time to meet with clients results in people feeling as if their representation is not adequate. This sentiment was also a finding in the Jay Johnson report. As with support petitions, having available high quality legal representation in custody and visitation cases would result in more meaningful and final orders, greater litigant satisfaction, less potential for future court <coughs> appearances on modification and or visitation matters, and a reduction in court calendars. It is for these reasons that I strongly endorse the addition of more well-trained attorneys available to accept court assignment on support, paternity, custody, and visitation matters, including civil legal service providers who are authorized to accept such cases. For far too long, there has been a perception and a feeling by many, the majority of whom are black and people of color, that race and ethnicity inform litigants' experience of the family court. The report commissioned by our chief judge found that family courts are historically and currently under-resourced despite high volume courts, them being high volume courts, and they perpetuate a dehumanizing experience, which we challenge every single day. Um, this has had a disparate impact on black and Latinx litigants, which has created a second class system of justice for people of color in New York State. This perception, this reality, this justice gap can be changed with the availability and expansion of civil legal services whose role is to provide quality legal representation for the thousands of individuals who come to our family court. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Shelley. You're welcome. Judge Shelley, if I were asked to venture an educated guess as to what a majority of this court would think about your argument to expand the right to counsel, I think you'd have us. That said, if you were testifying before a legislative body that might hold the purse strings for us, 
What points would you make to convince them of the value of expanding the right as you described, particularly in the upfront side of the support cases? I would stress the value of having lawyers explaining the process to individuals so that they would understand what their legal obligations are. There are many people who avoid family court because they're afraid. They, don't, they lack the knowledge. They don't realize that they can present whatever proof they actually do have rather than avoid it and present to the court, this is all I can afford at this particular time, and that would move the cases along. Um, it's very frustrating for a petitioner who is dealing with a respondent who hasn't met his or her legal obligation, and he or she who is facing possible incarceration has a right to counsel, but the petitioner, he or she, does not have that right and is fully confused sometimes and not understanding the process. And even though our support magistrates make their best effort to explain the law without giving legal advice, it is a challenge and a struggle, and they look at the clock and they're trying to move things along um, so there would be certain benefits in that people would become more accountable because they're more fully knowledgeable about their rights. Um, and there would be probably fewer people escaping uh, and avoiding their obligations. Um, and then we'd spend more time, less time, on the hearings that involve their possible incarceration for their failure to comply. Thank you. That was a very thoughtful and a responsible response. Thank you. Anyone? Okay. Judge Gary. Just briefly, um, this is a, a statement more than a question, but, but Judge Jolly, I wanted to thank you for, um, although your duties are primarily New York City based, of course, um, for your knowledge and understanding in the statement about the um, precarious situation in the third and fourth departments, because that is a matter of great concern to me. Um, and the state bar, as you know, had just put out the study, the rural representation issues, and particularly in these busy courts, are of profound um, concern. You're most and welcome. thank you. You're most welcome. Yeah. Any other questions? Judge Marks. Just a, a quick question. Does, um, Judge Jolly, does the money that we have in the judiciary budget, $100 million, uh, 15 of which gets passed on to Iola, but the remainder? Um, is paid out in grants to some 80 legal services providers. Does that money help uh, in, in any significant way address the dearth of, of counsel that you've described in so many cases in family court? Not those who represent the parents. There are um, pockets of money that go to those who represent the children in the custody and visitation matters um, and in some of the support matters, but not specific representation to the parents. Is there some reason for that or is that an oversight? Or? I, I don't know. <laughs> I wish I knew. I could, I could we'll do some research. That. I don't know what, what the reason is for that. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Judge Jolly. You're most welcome. Our next speaker is Sheila Boston, a most accomplished litigator and, of course, the 69th president of the New York City Bar Association. Under uh, Sheila Boston's leadership, the city bar has been out front, absolutely out front on the legal profession's efforts to meet the pandemic-related legal needs of low-income, <coughs> excuse me, individuals and families. And we thank you, Ms. Boston, for your leadership and for your members' service. You have the floor. Chief Judge D. Fiore, Judge Marks, Presiding Justices, and State Bar President Brown. Thank you so much for inviting me to speak today. I have submitted written remarks, which I will summarize in three parts. First, the City Bar Justice Center's pro bono legal services work and its focus on racial justice. Second, housing as a racial justice issue. And third, the digital divide and importance of bringing Wi-Fi to homeless shelters in New York. So first, how pro bono legal services advance racial justice. Thanks in part to support from Judiciary Civil Legal Services funding, the City Bar Justice Center provides free, high-quality civil legal services that each year benefit over 24,000 New Yorkers struggling with poverty and other forms of socioeconomic vulnerability. The Justice Center mobilizes law firms, corporate legal departments, and other legal institutions to provide pro bono legal services educate the public on pertinent legal issues, and impact public policy. Nonprofit legal services providers have a critical role to play in advancing racial justice. 
as a statistical matter, anywhere from a modest majority to upwards of three quarters or more of the clients served by the Justice Center are New Yorkers of color. And we believe the types of needs met by the Justice Center and many other legal services providers reflect endemic race-based exclusion from our society's socioeconomic benefits, including, unfortunately, in our legal system. The data supports this belief and is cited in my written submission. And of course, the pandemic has only worsened things. There is now a greater need for civil legal assistance addressing unemployment and public benefits, small business dislocation, housing issues, veterans assistance, and consumer credit problems. So how are we responding? Well, the Justice Center serves as many Yorkers, New Yorkers as it can by leveraging the talent and resources of the private bar. In this past year, we recruited, trained, and deployed roughly 2,000 attorney volunteers to provide legal assistance to Justice Center clients. Second, there's the importance of addressing underlying wounds. The Justice Center leverages policy and advocacy resources of the city bar to address systemic issues, from reforming New York's heirs property law to counteracting race-based exclusion from home ownership benefits to bridging the digital divide. Nonprofit legal services providers like the Justice Center also have a role to play in the mindset change that makes legal services more culturally sensitive and that makes advocacy for more thoughtfully informed by grassroots work. For example, the Justice Center has instituted a standing diversity, equity, and inclusion committee, which has a mandate to advance the organization's commitment to DEI principles. And as a quick example, the center provides DEI and racial justice focused pro bono attorney trainings. But let me hasten on to our work in housing, which is so vitally important because we're talking about one's home, where we gather with family and friends, um, it determines the schools our kids attend, and where we actually lay our heads at night. How we come to live where we live, how some people, especially people of color, people of less economic means, and people with criminal records face barriers to housing. And then there's the mental health impacts of being forcibly evicted from one's home. On the other hand, the mental health benefits of stable housing, the economic fallout of COVID-19 and the impending eviction crisis. And consider the positive access to justice and rule of law implications when the eviction playing field is leveled by making sure respondents have legal assistance even if they can't afford it. In this context, I must also acknowledge the impact of Secretary Jay Johnson's Equal Justice Report. I thank the Chief Judge for uh, that uh, appointment of him and for accepting the, the recommendations. The City Bar has established a working group on racial equity in state courts, and they're very engaged. But we need to work together to effectuate change for which the Equal Justice Report calls. For it warns us, quote, the sad picture that emerges is, in effect, a second-class system of justice for people of color in New York State, unquote. And this is particularly so, unfortunately, with respect to New York City housing. Legal representation of tenants in housing court that meets the highest standards of our profession is a powerful response to evictions, racial discrimination, and the challenges identified in Secretary Johnson's report. And the city bar stands 100% in support of New York City's right to counsel law. Why? Because we know it's working. According to annual reports of New York City's Office of Civil Justice, tenant representation's going up, evictions are going down, default judgments against tenants have dropped, and tenants with counsel are for, far more successful in being able to retain their homes. So it's a game changer, and it is leveling the playing field in court giving people a fighting chance to assert their legal rights and sending a message that all lives and homes of all New York City households are entitled to be treated with dignity and respect. Let me now pivot from tenants to homeowners and highlight how the Justice Center's homeowner stability work supports generational homeownership by New Yorkers of color. Our homeowner stability project engages in direct representation, public education, and law reform work to advocate for individuals and families of limited economic means who possess airship interests in intergenerationally owned homes. The vast majority of New Yorkers served by this advocacy belong to communities historically denied equal access to home ownership benefits due to structural racism in housing and lending policies. Without services like the Homeowner Stability Project, many such members of our community face the loss of longtime family homes and substantial home equity following mortgage and tax lien foreclosure or 
especially predatory petition actions brought by third-party investors who purchased heirs' partial interest in the homes and ensued to force a sale, displacing the heir occupants. Awareness of these issues led the Justice Center and the City Bar to take a leading role in a law reform movement culminating in New York's passage of the Uniform Partition of Heirs' Property Act. With the expanded state legal protections of heirship property owners, we have successfully secured wins in partition actions staffed by pro bono attorneys. This work shows the importance of pro bono supported civil legal services models that engage broader systemic issues. Finally, I'd like to touch on the City Bar's work in support of efforts to close the digital divide, particularly as it affects people who are experiencing homelessness. New York has long been a leader in ensuring that its individuals experiencing homelessness have access to shelter. Yet, thousands of residents in temporary housing lack basic internet access. The consequences of the stark digital divide in the lives of New Yorkers experiencing homelessness is devastating. These individuals and families are unable to search and apply for permanent housing and jobs, participate in remote schooling, apply for government benefits, stay connected to friends and family, or even obtain necessary medical care. The statistics are staggering, but here's one that just blows my mind and I want to focus on. Nearly one in 10 children enrolled in New York City district or charter schools were identified as homeless in the 2019 to 20 school year. That's over 110,000 children. The COVID-19 pandemic has significantly exacerbated the barriers resulting from the digital divide, raising the stakes to literally life or death, particularly for Black and Hispanic New Yorkers who are disproportionately represented among those experiencing homelessness. The Justice Center has documented the problem of lack of reliable internet access in homeless shelters in extensive reporting, and the City Bar will continue to advocate for internet access and provide pro bono representation to individuals and families experiencing homelessness. We believe the state needs to require and fund all local social service districts to provide internet access for all individuals residing in temporary housing. I thank you for listening. I thank you for your support of civil legal services. Thank you, Ms. Boston. So you describe, and for those of us, and we are all familiar with the center's work and enviable breadth of programming that's going on there. If, you ha ha if we asked you, and I am asking you, are there any particular programs there that you think are particularly promising or should even be thought about bringing to scale? You're talking about the centers, the actual justice centers programming? Oh my goodness, are you really gonna make me pick one or two? Um, so, um, first and foremost though, let me just say, right to counsel, right to counsel. That really is what we emphasize the most, both at the center and the city bar itself. If there were one program, I'm especially enamored with what we've been doing in housing, um, uh, with ERAP and, and trying to help those. It, it's just, I, mean, I have to admit, I'm passionate about it. It's like, I think you could probably hear and see. Um, but the housing, but don't get me wrong, veterans assistance and all of the other projects we have. We have 12 projects in particular at the center. All of them are very important. But housing to me is like the crucial issue that's facing us right now. And one more question before I turn it over to my colleagues. On the issue of airship interest, how do we educate folks mm -hmm. on that topic? I mean, is it through the Bar Association? Do we first start with the lawyers? I, because my fear is that it's not at the forefront of people's minds. And I agree. How foundationally important that is, yeah. I agree. So yes, I think bar associations are certain, uh, certainly should play a role in this, but I know earlier you were talking about even um, uh, worship centers or religious, the religious community. I think that's also a very good method and way of helping the community, particularly when we're talking about, black, about blacks and Latinos. Um, we could have lawyers and others come to churches and educate um, everyone about what they need to do. Thank you. Any questions for uh, Sheila? Uh, Ms. Boston, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you, you very much, uh, Madam President. We appreciate you taking the time and Thank being you. here today. Okay, our next presenter is Christopher O'Malley. He is, of course, the Executive Director of the IOLA Fund, established by the legislature in 1983, and which plays a central role 
in supporting the efforts of civil legal service providers. We're grateful to you, Mr. O'Malley, for your leadership of IOLA and for taking the time to join us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chief Justice DeFoy, members of the panel, my name is Chris O'Malley. I'm the executive director of the IOLA Fund and a member of the Permanent Commission on Access to Justice. A few years ago, I was given the opportunity to present to this panel about the importance of infrastructure spending for nonprofits and the debilitating effect that chronic underfunding can have for providers. However, in ways no one ever could have imagined or wished for, the events of the past few years have made infrastructure spending even more crucial for the success of nonprofits. Today, I'd like to look at how organizations provided services during the pandemic and how much those infrastructure outlays cost as well as provide an update on some of the projects I highlighted in 2019 to demonstrate the impact that infrastructure spending can have, not only on the essentials of life, but also help address the broader systemic issues around racial justice. Finally, I would like to suggest how funders can better support infrastructure. During the height of the pandemic, it's no exaggeration to say that without infrastructure spending, the provision of legal services in New York State would have ground to a halt. Providers' innovative use of such platforms as Zoom, Microsoft Teams, document assembly programs, phone upgrades, and case management systems allowed them to work outside the office and serve their clients, whether it was a Zoom presentation on how to apply for benefits, a Know Your Rights webinar, or remote intake. There were also collaborative efforts during the pandemic, led by the Permanent Commission's Tech Working Group and working with IOLA and NYSTEC, 13 free weekly webinars were held with hundreds of attendees on topics ranging from how to, set up legal, uh, how to set up a legal program to work remotely to virtual court hearings and electronic delivery systems. These efforts, in turn, were enhanced by the Office of Court Administration's own efforts to improve and advance e-filing, its installation of technology kiosks in many courthouses, and its own innovative use of video appearances. But all this great work required money. For licenses, laptops, scanners, printers, voice over internet protocol systems, virtual private networks, and of course, technological support staff to ensure it was all working. To give an idea of how much organizations spent during the pandemic on necessary infrastructure uh, outlays, I surveyed two providers, Legal Aid Society of the Northeastern New York and Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. Both spent over $300,000 during the pandemic on infrastructure expenses. And many of these, especially for staff and upgrades, will be ongoing. These numbers from just two of IOLA's 73 grantees indicate that overall spending on infrastructure during the pandemic was well into the millions. But as we begin to move away from the crisis of the pandemic, we know that infrastructure spending is much more than just purchasing technology. So I wanted to update two initiatives to look at the progress made and develop some of the ways infrastructure funding can be used going forward. The Housing Data Coalition is an exciting collaborative project that was created in response to the increased representation of low-income tenants through the city's universal access program. One of the vexing problems facing attorneys in housing court is the vast amount of publicly available building data, which is very difficult to access. Advocates had to first find and then click through multiple websites to gather information, and there was no method for collecting or aggregating data to run reports and identify trends. Working with Mobilization for Justice and Lenox Hill Neighborhood House and funded by a modest grant from IOLA, Housing Data, Housing Data Coalition created a number of apps, including Who Owns What, which allows an advocate to simply type in an address and using a database of over 160,000 properties, discover other properties a landlord might own or be associated with, enabling advocates to decide which buildings in the neighborhood to organize in and see what communities a landlord might be targeting or if a building is financially over leveraged. The development of this app demonstrates the need to think in an expansive way about what constitutes infrastructure. While it's important to spend money to upgrade and build out technological infrastructure, it's also important to think about how to put together and support people with legal knowledge and people with coding skills to develop innovative tools for specific legal problems. Infrastructure is also much more than just technological tools or brick and mortar improvements. In 2018, the Permanent Commission made recommendations regarding infrastructure as part of the Justice for All strategic planning guidance. 
It highlighted that for civil legal aid providers to achieve their goals, they must expand their capacity, and this would require strong internal operations and infrastructure, including, quote, the recruitment, retention, and development of a diverse legal aid workforce that will better represent the community it serves. While this recommendation was important in 2018, the events of last summer and the focus on addressing racial inequities has made it even more vital. The New York Legal Services Coalition, consisting of 48 providers, created a program around this critical infrastructure need. To give some context, data from Iola grantees shows that over the last several years, the number of staff attorneys identifying as people of color has more than doubled from 287 to 589. However, the challenge is how to retain those attorneys and make sure that they become future leaders. The coalition, working with the Shriver Center and partially funded by a grant from Iola, developed an innovative program entitled Leadership for Justice to address that issue. In 2019, 60 public interest leaders from 17 legal service organizations became the first cohort to receive this training, which included an online program, as well as an intensive five-day in-person training and group follow-up work. When I first presented to you, it seemed likely to take several years to realize tangible benefits. However, this summer, the Permanent Commission created a survey for participants, and the results were very impressive. Participants had overwhelmingly positive feelings about the program, and a full 100% reported that they still use lessons learned from the training. Even more remarkably, 56% of the respondents had received a promotion since the training, including positions such as program director, attorney in charge, director of legal advocacy, and supervising attorney. Of course, it will still take time and a huge amount of thoughtful effort to develop civil legal age leadership that truly represents the communities they serve. Resources will be needed for training and ongoing support for diversity and inclusion initiatives, as well as efforts to create more inclusive boards and efforts to create competitive salary structures. To succeed, funders will need to commit to spending over time to develop the diverse leadership necessary to best serve New York's communities. How then can funders help support a stronger environment for nonprofits by supporting infrastructure spending? First, don't think in a narrow way about how to address a problem. Using the example of housing legal services, the answer is not always just hiring more attorneys. The most effective funding will include providing infrastructure support, whether it's additional staff to handle complex government contracts or upgrading software. Besides these type of direct expenditures, it would also allow space to develop new tools specific to the services being offered. This might take the form of a direct grant for infrastructure, or it could come in the form of general operating support grants, which allow providers to address all the spending necessary to support an organization. IOLA takes this approach, and it has allowed our grantees to function in a more sustainable and effective manner. manner excuse me. <clears throat> Lastly, I would urge funders to take a more comprehensive view of what constitutes infrastructure. On a national level, there is a movement away from the notion of infrastructure encompassing just things like highways and bridges and recognizing that universal pre-K or childcare support can also be infrastructure spending. Likewise, in civil legal aid, we must recognize that funding to develop more inclusive leadership, either through a training program like the Leadership Institute or dedicating funds to improve the recruitment and retention of diverse attorneys is also an infrastructure issue. I hope this update on the importance of infrastructure and how funders can support the infrastructure necessary to improve access to justice has been helpful to the panel. Thank you. I think it has been helpful. And uh, Mr. O'Malley, you certainly caught my attention several years ago when you raised and implored us to focus on the importance of infrastructure. So you've done it again today to Justice Acosta's point earlier in the proceedings, your expansive view of infrastructure in the context of civil legal service providers. <laughs> So as my husband used to say to our children, there are only so many jelly beans in the jar, right? <laughs> <laughs> there are only so many jelly beans in our jar. If you had to prioritize a place to start with expanding this definition of interest, infrastructure and focusing us on, on funding there, what would it be? I would almost argue for a, a phil philosophical shift I think that people need to get away from the tyranny of the project and look at the overall functioning of an organization. 
Um, you might recall a few years ago, uh, FEGS, which was one of the largest uh, human service providers of in New York State, collapsed. And basically, it was for want of a nail. There was inadequate infrastructure spending on finance. Government contracts tend to come in sporadically and late. There wasn't enough um, focus on how to develop other sources of funding. All of these things collectively call, caused an over $200 million organization to fail. And on a much smaller scale, you can see that with organizations. And I think what's important is to build on the um, momentum of the pandemic. I think it really brought home, you know, thank goodness we did have these options and we could provide services in a different way, but all of that costs money. And so again, think of the entire organization, not just a particular project and how you can ensure that it's going to be able to address all of the needs. And to use your jelly bean metaphor, you might be able to stretch those jelly beans with some of the new technology that we've introduced. <laughs> Just to follow up on that, so, so a, a more expansive definition, because I've heard um, the executive director of the Ford Foundation also <laughs> asking for a more expansive definition right. to include human capital. Uh, you suggested universal pre-K. Uh, is that an expanded definition that's being adopted uh, in the public sector? where we find a lot of the money being allocated for some of this? Uh, um, I, you know, I think it's a process, and I think it's, it's definitely uh, gaining traction. And so, whereas I think a, a few years ago, um, when you know, I first looked at infrastructure and, and mentioned it in the context of expanding the future leadership, you know, that might have struck people as the future leadership, but infrastructure is, you know, buying a computer for today, but it's not. And there's, there's no way to get from A to B without supporting the resources, the staff that can help you get there in a meaningful way. And while it's fantastic that, you know, the, the uh, effort I highlighted, 56% of the participants have already received a promotion, that's fantastic, but that work has got to keep on going and going and going and it, and it takes resources. Thank you. Anyone else? Judge, if I may. Uh, uh, Mr. O'Malley, uh, thank you for the good work that you do. I think uh, we all benefit from that. Uh, my question is, and I appreciate the broader definition of the word infrastructure, and I think it's appropriate. Uh, my, my, my question is, uh, in light of the, the efforts that were given uh, to civil legal services in the sense of this broader definition. Are the civil legal services agencies up to date, if you will, now from the additional spending? Because obviously going forward, there is a continuing need for IT and infrastructure right. updating and maintenance that I think we're all gonna face. Right. But uh, if, it's, if it's not up to date now, and if there's not additional funding to get there, then I would fear the result of that and especially to the clients that are served. Right. I mean, you know, again, you have to look at it across the spectrum. Iola has 73 grantees. I would say across the board, our grantees are in a better technological infrastructure and just general infrastructure place than they were several years ago. And I think that's partly because people are recognizing all of those needs. Some organizations, like all things in life, some organizations are in a better position, but I think there's just definitely a general trend of people are focusing more on infrastructure internally. And, and in many of these grantees, not defense, but the reality is if you have a funder who says 90% of funding has to go to strictly to, to hire attorneys, there's not a lot you can do about that. So partly the, the onus lies on funders to be more aware of this and to give um, more flexibility or give direct technology grants or infrastructure grants or however they particularly want to do it. But that also has to be part of the conversation. It's not fair to the providers who oftentimes are kind of locked into contracts, frankly, and they have no choice. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, Mr. O'Malley. Thank you. Our next speaker is Neil Steinkamp, who is a managing director of Scout, who is, of course, a global financial advisory firm. 
and thankfully they serve as pro bono consultant to our permanent commission. Over the years, Mr. Steinkamp and his firm have uh, provided us with most valuable data and analyses to help us better understand the full dimension and contours of our access gap. And this year, I believe uh, Mr. Steinkamp will speak to the survey that was executed addressing uh, the experiences of litigants in our virtual courts. Mr. Steinkamp, once again, thank you for being here. And of course, thank you for your extraordinary service to the people of the state of New York. Thank you. Chief Judge DeFiori and distinguished panelists, it is an honor for me to have the opportunity to provide remarks before you today. My name is Neil Steinkamp. I'm a managing director at Stout, where I lead the firm's transformative change practice and pro bono practice and serve as a consultant to the New York Permanent Commission on Access to Justice. I'm here today to speak about the survey of court users recently prepared by the Permanent Commission on Access to Justice in collaboration with members of the judiciary, the New York Legal Services Coalition, and other stakeholders across the state. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and related disruption to court activities, the New York Unified Court System implemented virtual proceedings, expanded e-filing and other uses of technology intended to allow access to the courts in a remote setting. The future access to the courts working group of the Permanent Commission on Access to Justice set out to learn about the experience of court users in New York related to these technological and process innovations by conducting a statewide survey of represented and unrepresented court users. I am not aware of any other similar court user surveys deployed during the COVID-19 pandemic, making New York's statewide court user survey an innovative development in understanding court users' experiences. In early 2021, members of the working group recognized the importance of gathering feedback from court users, especially as court operations were changing in response to the pandemic. They recommended that the working group consider developing a survey to do so. The working group, members of which are judges, civil legal service providers, representatives from the Office of Court Administration and law firm partners, identified initial topics for the survey and the demographic information that would be important to gather to further analyze specific segments of survey respondents. For approximately 12 weeks, the working group met weekly to develop survey questions, as well as electronic and paper versions of the survey in both English and Spanish. Once the draft survey was completed, the working group conducted user testing by asking select civil legal services providers to identify clients who'd be willing to complete the survey and provide the working group feedback. In addition, the working group asked for feedback from the New York Legal Services Coalition, as well as organizations interacting with unrepresented court users. This valuable feedback enabled the working group to refine the survey in ways that would result in a higher response rate and more nuanced insights. After several iterations of survey ref refinement, the working group reviewed the survey with the commission and made minor but important revisions based on members' feedback. The survey was finalized and distributed to legal services organizations and other organizations beginning in December of 2020. It's important to note that legal services organizations throughout the state extended significant effort in distributing the survey and collecting survey responses. Oftentimes, their clients required assistance with understanding the purpose of the survey or the meaning of certain questions. In other instances, clients needed assistance completing the survey, some of whom were only able to complete the survey on paper due to a lack of access to technology. Thus. The very administration of the survey serves as a reminder of the time required of legal services organizations assisting clients with digital access of all types, which is also reinforced by the survey responses, as I'll discuss. Generally, the court user survey confirmed that virtual proceedings and certain online technologies have made justice more accessible for some court users, but also indicated that many court users, especially unrepresented court users, are facing significant challenges accessing justice remotely. Throughout the working group's activities, it was clear that there's an important role for courts to play in assessing the experiences of court users. Today, I'll share an overview of certain key observations from the survey responses. A comprehensive and detailed analysis of survey responses will be included in the annual report of the Permanent Commission. As of June 30th, there were 367 full responses to the survey, 54% from represented court users, 46% from unrepresented court users. Across the, the state, um, uh, responses were collected from counties all over the state uh, on a variety of civil case types, and most responses uh, were household incomes of less than $35,000. More than half of the unrepresented survey respondents indicated that they did not have a lawyer because they could not afford one. 
20% indicated they did not have a lawyer because they did not know how to connect with or find a free lawyer. And another 20% indicated they did not have a lawyer because they tried to connect with legal aid, uh, but were told that they were not able to help them. Overwhelmingly, unrepresented survey respondents indicated that they were concerned about handling their cases without a lawyer. The most significant reason for this concern was that the respondent did not understand the process. More than 80% of represented survey respondents indicated that the outcome of their case was favorable to them or that their case was satisfactorily settled. 50% of unrepresented survey respondents indicated that they were not satisfied with the outcome of their case or the outcome of their case was unfavorable to them. A significantly higher percentage of represented survey respondents, 74%, indicated that the information about their court date was clear compared to unrepresented survey respondents, 58%. Three out of four unrepresented survey respondents indicated they needed assistance with forms, while less than half of represented survey respondents indicated they needed assistance with forms. 26% of unrepresented survey respondents indicated that the reason why they needed assistance filling out forms was that they did not know which forms they needed to complete. More than 30% of unrepresented survey respondents indicated sending the papers to the court online was very difficult, and an additional 26% indicated that it was somewhat difficult. The overwhelming majority of survey respondents felt respected by court staff. 28% of unrepresented court users indicated that they were not treated with respect by court staff, and 15% of represented court users. Only 38% of unrepresented survey respondents indicated that their court experience was significantly better than expected, whereas 62% of represented survey respondents indicated that their court experience was significantly better than expected. Survey respondents who indicated that they were not treated with respect also overwhelmingly indicated that their experiences were moderately worse or significantly worse than expected. This demonstrates that a court user's belief that they are treated with respect significantly impacts their court experience. The majority of survey respondents did not have problems with virtual, hearing, virtual proceedings, regardless of representation. However, approximately 30% of respondents did report problems with virtual proceedings. While most survey respondents indicated that they'd be willing to appear virtually in the future, approximately 25% of survey respondents indicated a preference to not appear virtually. More unrepresented survey respondents, 25%, than represented survey respondents, 14%, strongly disagreed with the statement, I would appear virtually in the future if provided the opportunity. Based on its experience developing the survey, feedback from court users and legal service provider community, and insights gained through its analyses, the working group developed the following three primary recommendations. Continue collecting and analyzing responses to the court user survey annually in coordination with the New York Legal Services Coalition and other legal services providers and organizations or agencies interacting with unrepresented court users. Review court notices and forms for purposes of simplification and translation, first into plain language and then into the most common languages spoken by court users. And three, Provide court users the choice to opt out of remote proceedings if they're unable to participate because they lack the technology or digital knowledge, have physical, cognitive, or language limitations, or for any other reason, and ensure the availability of local resources who can serve as trusted sources of information if court users do not understand the information they received, or if they need assistance completing forms, locating supplemental information, submitting forms to the court, or participating in virtual proceedings. In closing, the court user survey confirmed that virtual proceedings and certain online technologies have made justice more accessible for some court users, but also indicated that many court users, especially unrepresented court users, are facing significant challenges accessing justice remotely, challenges that we must work to better understand and develop effective and sustainable solutions for. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steinkamp. Uh, thanks for uh, analyzing the responses. Any questions before? So I do have a question. So, so with regard to folks who responded that they were having difficulty understanding our notices and forms, aside from looking to possibly streamline them and more easily present them with more plain language, if that's a phrase I can use. Are there any other 
people-directed ways that we can assist those folks. Were you able to glean that from the, the survey? For example, the virtual uh, uh, court, nav the, the court navigators program, whether it's virtual or having somebody on staff to field questions. Uh, so the survey responses do not specifically indicate, you know, what the solutions would be. Um, really, the survey is designed to help us ask better questions. Um, and as you said, um, understand the contours of uh, the justice gap in New York. I do think some of the initiatives that were discussed earlier um, and that you just mentioned in terms of uh, virtual navigators, um, faith-based communities, other public libraries, other local places that people can go, trusted places with trusted faces, um, people who can help people navigate online forums, virtual proceedings are, are key to helping people understand the information that they're getting and to be able to navigate those processes. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Steinkamp? Mr. Steinkamp, we continue to thank you and your firm for your service, and I look forward to doing more important work with you over the course of this year. So thank you very much, and thank you for taking the time to be here in person today. Thank you. Our next uh, presenter, the last presenter before our break, is Professor Conrad Johnson. Professor Johnson is the director of the Columbia Law School's Lawyering in the Digital Age Clinic, which he co-founded in 2001 as the first clinic in the nation to focus exclusively on the impact of technology on law practices. In light of Professor Johnson's deep expertise in this area, we look forward, sir, to hearing your insights and recommendations. And thank you, Professor, for taking the time to be here today. Thank you all for having me, having me speak. Asking a law professor to get quickly to the point is a tall order, <laughs> but for this august body, I will try. Um, you know, Chief Justice, the Chief Judge, and uh, so many of the speakers have already spoken to the strong link between inequality and the dis digital divide. So let's talk about the digital divide. What is it? Um, for our purposes, it means a lack of access to three things, the internet, to the devices that we'd use to get to the internet, and a lack of digital literacy to understand how to use the internet and devices to participate in virtual court proceedings, to gain access to free civil legal services, and to get the relief from administrative bodies and others who could help those in need. A second thing to keep in mind is if, if the pandemic were to magically disappear today, the legal profession is not going to forget everything we have learned about properly conducting virtual proceedings or online collaboration with clients. New skills and habits of mind that we have acquired will continue to be regular features of the profession long into the future. So with that, I have a, a few recommendations. The first is obvious. Recognize the impact of the digital divide on access to justice. Technology is still in short supply when it comes to meaningful access to justice for huge swaths of New Yorkers. For example, 1.5 million New York City residents have neither a mobile connection nor a home broadband connection. 46% of New York City households living in poverty do not have broadband at home. Similar disparities exist throughout the state, and regrettably, there is a predictable and disturbing overlap between areas where the digital divide is most pronounced and under-resourced communities. The barriers created by the digital divide are not reserved for people living in poverty or communities of color. They extend to many seniors as well as those grappling with physical and cognitive deficits. So perhaps a brief thought experiment might be useful here. Take a few seconds to think of online resources that would help underserved communities and the public generally, what comes to mind? Is it the ability to apply, on, to apply online for public benefits, the ability to access economic relief suffered during the pandemic, like the emergency rental assistance program, which has gone underutilized? Uh, is it access to do-it-yourself forms in multiple languages, or to e-filing? Uh, a lack of information about the notices, the, the seemingly endless ebb and flow of administrative and executive orders related to evictions and foreclosures, or simply the opportunity to participate in virtual proceedings. Now, consider the reality that so many of those resources are, at best, difficult to secure without access to the internet, to the point that as a practical matter, 
they are unavailable to millions of New Yorkers who live on the unfortunate side of the digital divide. A next recommendation, equalize access to virtual proceedings. Many courts recognize the viability of utilizing virtual proceedings of varying types where appropriate. Uh, these proceedings can include routine adjournments, status conferences, court-assisted settlement negotiations, or full-blown trials. It's worth noting that the, that the courts that handle the most cases, like the family court and the housing court, are typically under-resourced compared to their relative use by the public. It is also true that many who come to those courts expecting justice are disproportionately living on the unfortunate side of the digital divide. These are precisely the litigants who can least afford to miss employment, juggle childcare or elder care responsibilities, or spend time and money on transportation to sit for hours in crowded courtrooms for matters that could have taken only a fraction of that time if handled online. This is especially critical to everyone's health during the pandemic. The bottom line here is that participation in virtual proceedings cannot become a matter of preference only for those who can afford it. Similarly, it is unrealistic and unfair to expect legal services organizations to provide proper technology and training to their clients absent additional funding for that purpose. And as uh, Judge Snyder and others have noted, um, it takes a lot more time and energy to prepare folks for virtual proceedings than uh, in the traditional way. And it would be important for the courts to adjust their expectations accordingly. The next re recommendation is also obvious. Facilitate online access to civil legal services. It's obvious that having the lawyer makes a huge difference. Um, OCA has been critical to narrowing the justice gap. Still, as we speak, the digital divide separates legal service providers uh, from far too many of their current and potential clients. It's essential that the legislature provide additional funding to bridge that divide. The key word in that sentence is additional. Funding to bridge the digital divide cannot come at the expense of current allocations by OCA to legal services programs that are already stretched beyond capacity. So what can we do to bridge the divide? First, some good news. Uh, there's been some progress on the connectivity front. State and federal initiatives have helped make minimal access to broadband more affordable. Those programs are helpful, but still beyond the economic reach of many. So too, there needs to be more done in that area. The second is improve access to devices and digital literacy. Connectivity is helpful only if people have the devices and the knowledge of how to use those devices to gain access to justice. Therefore, funding innovation in pilot projects that bridge the digital divide uh, by addressing connectivity device, uh, devices and digital literacy could be helpful. A year ago, my clinic got involved with the Legal Aid Society on the Justice Tablets project. The goal was to find the least expensive, user-friendly, most reliable internet-connected device that could be lent on a circulating basis to clients who wish to engage in virtual proceedings or are unable to come to the office for assistance. We purchased three prototype devices, preloaded them with easy-to-use software and cellular technology, devised a workflow for circulating the devices, and developed user-friendly instructions and support materials. We've begun field testing the justice tablets with legal aid clients and attorneys. The natural next step is to scale up the project so that the devices can be deployed effectively. It should be noted that 50 justice tablets could be purchased for approximately $17,000 to $20,000, excluding the cost of cellular service for a year. And the clinic will support the justice tablets project by continued field testing of the tablets having law students serve as digital navigators by working with Legal Aid Society as liaisons to assist their clients in utilizing the tablets to obtain legal services and participate in virtual proceedings. So in conclusion, the use of technology to expand access to justice is a pressing need. The need will continue into the future long after the pandemic recedes. The digital divide is a manifestation of inequality and disproportionately affects communities of colors color, seniors, and other vulnerable populations. Therefore, with great respect, we encourage the Chief Judge and through you, the legislature and the executive to consider the importance of addressing the digital divide 
to ensure equal access to justice. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Professor. Justice Gary. Um, professor, uh, the justice tablets, and I know you've only tried it in a very small sphere so far, but what, what would you envision would be the length of time that someone would be in possession of it? Is it, is it given over just for a particular proceeding and then returned, or is it kept for a number of weeks or months, or how does that work? Well, if you're asking for my wish, it would be just to give it to folks, but that's unrealistic. Um, 50 tablets could go a long way to giving folks who are going to be engaged in virtual proceedings or are otherwise unable to come into an office an opportunity on a crisis basis to get ready. We've participated in, in one of the early virtual trials uh, uh, and it involved an 83-year-old woman who was uh, in the midst of a primary use holdover. Um, it took a lot of hours to prepare her, but she managed to get through a four-day trial and do well, I might add. Um, but it was for that duration of time, not forever. And so I imagine in the first instance of this, and, I, and I, you know, this has been said earlier, it's a process. So we should try to start with something that could work, lend it out for pe to people who need it while they need it, and get it back. The tablets that we have are easy to send back and forth. They're not bulky like this. They're smaller tablets, you know, eight inch, 10 inch tab tablets, easy to send back and forth. And with Wi-Fi connectivity, you don't need anything else. I mean, with cellular connectivity, you don't need anything else. Um, so it could work. I think on a smaller pilot basis, and we'll see. We'll learn as we go, and we'll see whether or not more is better, longer is better. But without the devices, you know, having a cell phone to be able to arrange for an adjournment, fine. Having a cell phone to do a four day holdover, very different animal. Thank you. Judge Marks? Professor Johnson. Um, would it be more practical and maybe even less expensive to have people um, who, who uh, don't have technology or have difficulty navigating the technology go to, um, and keeping in mind the, the great advantages of not having to travel all the way to the downtown courthouse and lose a day at work and uh, transportation costs and childcare mm -hmm. problems and so on, would it be more practical to have that group of people go to community groups, nonprofits, religious institutions in their community where they could use technology there and perhaps receive assistance when they would need it from people? That uh, could work for some, Judge. And it's, a, it's, it's, it's certainly, as I think about you know, Legal Aid's single stop program or taking justice out into the community, those are worthy efforts and those are things we ought to try and experiment with. Um, but for a lot of folks, it's just not practical. And also, I will say that there is a lot of very private information that gets exchanged during these interactions. Uh, and one needs to feel comfortable with the people you're with. Um, and maybe third parties at a religious institution or um, at a community center would be that person. But ultimately, the lawyer is going to have to be involved in this and ultimately, there's going to need to be a lot of run-up to the ability to engage meaningfully in a virtual process. It took us hours and hours to prepare the client I just described earlier for that trial. I mean, I've prepared literally thousands of people, clients, over my, my years. This, this was by like a magnitude of 10. Um, that's why the digital navigators that we're thinking about might be able to reduce some of that time. But ultimately, it's, it, what you're suggesting is part of a solution, but it's not a complete solution. Does that help? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, uh, Professor, uh, thank you for your, your comments. Uh, and I appreciate your discussing the digital divide in components. And I think you're spot on there. I think it's easy to, to bring the internet to certain areas and to provide sufficient broadband. And it's also, 
well then, if the dollars are there, it's easy to provide a gadget and equipment to people. But the component that is most difficult to fix and to really get at is the digital literacy component. Because you can put me somewhere where there's internet and give me a tablet and give me all the online platforms, but if I can't use it, it's getting me nowhere. The, the part of the population that is most vulnerable also suffers from this greater illiteracy. So my question that I struggle with is how we fix that, how we get at that sector of our population most vulnerable and that has suffered most from the, the, the di lack of digital access and, and knowledge. Well, thank, thank you for the question. And, and it, it does highlight the fact that when we're talking about the provision of free civil legal services, we are by definition, because of income eligibility, talking about a population that is largely on the unfortunate side of the digital divide. The good news is some folks now have, you know, mobile literacy. They have some sense of how to use the smartphones. And the reason we chose tablets with, in conjunction with the Legal Aid Society was that we thought the tablet was an intermediate step between this and between the laptop. The tablet is something you could learn to, to adjust to. There is some familiarity there. So there is that. This was a bit helpful. The other piece of it is it's going to take folks who are going to spend the time to help bring folks up to speed. This, think about the steps, the progress that has taken place over the last 18 months within the legal profession. Um, there's a lot of things, Judge Marks and everybody up here knows this, a lot of things that a lot of folks said at the very beginning, no can do, won't do it, can't do it, not, not available. And in 18 months, that story has changed somewhat. Progress will not be linear. There will be some bumps in the road. But it has taken some time of people getting used to it. And I think, you know, the, the woman that I just used as an example in the holdover proceeding, by the time it was over with, she wanted to continue to use the equipment. And so as Judge Gary mentioned, this is, you know, this was, it could have been an ongoing process if we had the resources to make it one. Um, and so I think that the more inroads we can make in terms of making things available, law schools can play a real role in terms of acting as intermediaries, digital navigators, if you will, uh, because you know my students, even the ones who would think they were Luddites, are far more comfortable with technology than most people in the world because they've grown up with it. And they, it, they would find it enriching and helpful to be able to help someone else along. And I think once you see somebody get that help, they want more if you've done it, done the job well. Is that helpful? That's helpful. Yes. Very Thank helpful. You. Thank, Thank you, you, Professor. You're welcome. So we've come to the point in the proceedings where we will take a 15 minute break. We invite those of you who would like to remain for the virtual portion of the proceedings to do so. Just let us know so we can bring you on the other side of the screen so that you can view the screen. For those of you who must take your leave, we thank you for being here today. Thank you.
Good afternoon. We are back from our break. And now we are to my most favorite part of the hearings, where we'll hear from clients and their lawyers. First up is Tanya Acosta, the client of Legal Services NYC, and she is accompanied today, <coughs> excuse me, by her attorney, Luis Enriquez, and they are joined, excuse me, I have a tickle in my throat, by Ron Rasmussen, the executive director of Legal Services NYC. <coughs> excuse me, Ms. Acosta. Yes. <coughs> Please proceed. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tanya Costa. Thank you so much for this opportunity to tell you my story today. I am a mother of four children, two of whom live with me at Jacob Reese Houses in Manhattan. One of my children lives with autism. My parents, originally from Puerto Rico, met in New York City in the 1970s when my dad returned from the war in Vietnam. I was born in Puerto Rico, but have lived in New York City since I was six months old. I'm a lifelong New Yorker and my children are lifelong New Yorkers. As a single mother of four, I need public housing to continue living in our hometown. Without it, there would be no life for us here. I used to work as a receptionist in a dermatologist office. It was a good job, but because NYCHA started a non-payment case against me, I had to take days off to go to court while also trying to bring my son to medical appointments. Because I miss work so much, I lost my job in October 2018. As soon as that happened, I informed NYCHA that I no longer had any income and that my rent should be reduced because I knew that I have a right to be charged not more than 30% of my income as rent. I uploaded documents showing my job loss to NYCHA's online portal, and I also uploaded, uploaded documents showing that two of my children no longer lived with me in the home. However, NYCHA repeatedly failed to process my rent adjustment and continued suing me for rent that was too high. Time after time, NYCHA's representatives came to court and admitted to the judge that they still had not processed my application to reduce my rent. They said that they did not have enough staff, that my account was somehow blocked, and an IT person had to unblock it, etc. The judge even wrote in a court order that NYCHA admitted that my application fell through the cracks. For the entirety of 2019, NYCHA failed to process my application while still suing me for rent that was too high. Then the worst thing imaginable happened. In January 2020, two weeks after I missed a court date due to being in the hospital, a marshal showed up and changed my locks, telling me that I was evicted. After more than a year of failing to reduce my rent due to my income change, which is their legal obligation, NYCHA moved to evict me and my children after I missed one court date. It's heartbreaking to learn firsthand that NYCHA prioritizes evicting families over charging them what's right. On that January day when the marshal changed the locks, I went to housing court to file an order to show cause to get back into my home. Luckily, I was assigned an attorney from Legal Services NYC. <laughs> quickly advocated to have the apartment unlocked so that I would not need to spend a night out in the street with my children. I was on the precipice of becoming a homeless family, but thanks to legal services, that did not happen. In addition to representing me in the non-payment case, my attorney told me that I can participate in a federal lawsuit against NYCHA for their practice of failing to reduce the rent for tenants like me who lost their income. It is then that I learned that I was not the only one going through this. My attorney told me that people across the entire city were going through the same ordeal with NYCHA. And so I signed up to be one of the plaintiffs in their federal case to force NYCHA to stop their illegal practices once and for all. A year after I joined the case, Legal Services NYC, together with the law firm Jenner and Block, were able to get justice for tenants and force NYCHA to change their practices. First, NYCHA agreed to give rent credits to the plaintiffs they overcharged. In all, NYCHA reimbursed close to 60000 to the plaintiffs. Second, NYCHA agreed to pay $130,000 to settle the case, part of which went to compensate the plaintiffs for the ordeal they went through and part to pay legal services NYC's lawyer fees. Third, 
NYCHA agreed to change the system to improve rent adjustments all across the city and to make sure that whenever tenants request a rent reduction because they lost their income, NYCHA has to resolve those requests before they can move to evict people. I'm very proud to have been a plaintiff in this case. After years of anguish of repeatedly being ignored by my management office, I finally felt heard. I am most excited about the changes brought upon by the settlement to improve NYCHA's rent reduction systems, which will benefit thousands of NYCHA tenants across the city. I hope that the changes will make sure that what happened to me will never happen to someone else, and that NYCHA will just tenants' rents on time and stop forcing hardworking families out on the street. Every family in NYCHA deserves to be treated with respect, and I'm glad new, uh, Legal Services NYC for for these changes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Preston. We certainly agree that indeed every family, NYCHA family, does deserve to be re uh, treated with respect. Anyone have any questions for Ms. Acosta? Ms. Acosta, I have one question for you. You're obviously very strong and uh, you present so well and persuasive. Do you think in the very begin? do you think in the very beginning that there was a difference because you were just an ordinary person there. If you had had a lawyer, would there have been a difference? You think yes. perhaps that application would not have fallen through the cracks? Yes, yes. Okay. If I had someone in the beginning to represent and to show me the steps on what I, you know, the, the process on what I can go and lead me in the right direction and point me, mm -hmm. I think I would have, I, I don't think it would have gotten as far as it did. Thank you for joining us today, um, uh, Ms. Acosta, and uh, good luck to you. Good luck to each of your four children. We wish thank them you well. so much. And thank, thank you, you to your lawyers and to you, of course, Mr. Rasmussen, for your leadership. Thank you. Thank you. Much. Our next presenter. Oh, okay. Ron is speaking. Oh, Ron, excuse me, oh. Ron. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Um, good afternoon, and thank you all, and especially Chief Judge DeFiore, for this opportunity to appear before you. Uh, my name is Ron Rasmussen. I'm the Executive Director of Legal Services NYC. You've just heard a really moving story about the challenges one woman and her family faced in seeking to assert their legal rights. After months of trying to get their rent reduced to the correct amount, months during which the attorneys for the landlord acknowledged to the court that they had not done what they were legally required to do, a family with four children got evicted. That should never happen. And it's only because Ms. Acosta was able to get a lawyer that she and her children were restored to their affordable apartment at a rent that is finally legal. Restoring Ms. Acosta to her home after she was evicted was, of course, our primary goal but fighting to fix the practices that put her and her children out on the street so that thousands of other New York City tenants would not be similarly victimized was also essential. And that work was only possible because of judiciary civil legal services funding. When our lawyers began representing Ms. Acosta, they knew that her problem was being faced by thousands of NYCHA tenants every single day throughout the city. When tenants' incomes change, as was the case for Ms. Acosta, they are obligated to report those changes. If the income goes down, the rents are legally required to be adjusted downward. Instead, we see case after case where tenants are being sued for rent they do not owe, threatened with eviction, and all too often evicted for rent they do not owe. The federal case brought against NYCHA in which Ms. Acosta was a plaintiff, Fields versus Russ, was just settled last month. As she described, it required NYCHA to set legal affordable rents and provide damages for the named plaintiffs. But most importantly, the settlement requires NYCHA to fix its illegal practices. They are now required to adjust tenants' rents within 60 days of receiving documentation of the loss of income, refrain from starting eviction proceedings while a rent adjustment is pending, inform tenants of the new rules, train staff, and report to us every six months so we can monitor their progress. The continuity and holistic nature of the services that we provide is what makes our work so powerful and so cost effective. In addition to fighting successfully on behalf of every single family and individual we represent, we fight to change the laws, practices, and policies that systemically operate to keep people poor. I wanna conclude 
by thanking Chief Judge DeFiore and Chief Administrative Judge Marks and the entire Office of the Court Administration for your continued commitment to funding for civil legal services. Without your support, the results you've just heard described by Ms. Acosta and which were realized through the settlement of Fields versus Russ would never have occurred. But I also wanna say that tenants throughout New York State remain desperate for help. COVID has continued to wreak economic hardship on low-income families. And it's only because New York State has continued to provide an eviction moratorium and a variety of other protections that we've not yet seen mass evictions, a tsunami that's been predicted for more than a year. But make no mistake, unless tenants get representation so that they can get access to emergency rental assistance program funds and properly document COVID-related hardship and have someone to fight on their behalf in the course throughout the state, that tsunami will occur. So we thank you for your strong support. And while we're genuinely appreciative, we also wanna be clear that access to justice is far from secure for so many in the state. We look forward to continuing our work in partnership with so many of you to address that ongoing challenge. Thank you. Thank you. And we look forward to our continuing partnership with you, sir. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you very much. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, good afternoon. Our next presenter will be Megan Boughton. She is a client of Legal Services of the Hudson Valley, and she is accompanied here today by her attorney, Adrian Thiel, and they're joined uh, today by Rachel Halperin, the Chief Executive Officer of Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. Good afternoon, Ms. Boughton. Good afternoon. My name is Megan Boughton, and I am many things. I am a former client of Legal Services of the Hudson Valley. I am a resident of Ulster County, New York. I am someone's sister and someone's daughter. I am an employee at the ARC, a local organization that promotes and protects the human rights of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. I am a survivor of domestic violence. But most importantly, I am a mother to two young girls, Gabriella and Zuri. I wanted to thank you for letting me speak today regarding the need for free legal services for victims of domestic violence, a need that I believe has grown as a result of the COVID pandemic. My daughter Zuri was born during the pandemic on September 18th. This should have been a happy time, but for me, it was terrifying. I had separated from her father prior to her, prior to her birth after he began to become possessive and violent toward me. He would threaten to shoot me and anyone I was close with. He had a quick temper and could suddenly blow up. Unfortunately, following the separation, he continued to harass me, saying things such as, I don't want to hurt a pregnant woman, but I will. He would drive by my house repeatedly to scare me stating that he would hurt me if I didn't respond quick enough or listen to him. Following my daughter's birth, he would send me photos of him holding a gun and threatening to harm my daughters and me. I was terrified. On one occasion, early in the morning, he threatened to drive by and shoot up our home, knowing that the baby and I were asleep inside. He did this because I did not respond promptly to a text message. I couldn't take it anymore, and I called the police to make a report. Criminal charges were filed against him, but he failed to show for his arraignment, and a warrant was issued for his arrest, but he was never arrested. I received an order of protection from criminal court, 
I was terrified for my family's safety. In retaliation, my abuser filed for paternity of my infant daughter, stating that he would seek custody of her since I was choosing to act out. At the time my abuser filed this petition, there was a warrant for his arrest out of a local city court and he was facing felony charges in county court as a multi-time felony offender. But because court appearances were virtual and the criminal courts were overwhelmed as a result of the pandemic, he was free to continue to threaten me and seek custody of my 10 month old daughter. I didn't understand what he had filed and what my options were. I was scared for my safety, but most of all, my children's safety. The Crime Victims Assistance Program for Ulster County referred me to legal services of the Hudson Valley and I was connected to Adrian Thiel in their Kingston office. Adrian walked me through the family court process so I knew what to expect, representing me in the paternity proceeding and then child support, and then in my custody case, which eventually went to a hearing. She drafted and filed petitions on my behalf and communicated with my abuser so that I would not have to. She assisted with me setting up the virtual court appearances and understanding the protocols that resulted from COVID. I now have sole physical legal custody of my daughter. I have child support for her and I have the ability to continue to take whatever steps are necessary to continue to ensure my family's safety. I can't even imagine what would have happened without the assistance of legal services of the Hudson Valley. I know that there are other victims out there who are scared and confused and need help navigating the legal system. It is my hope that my testimony today shows how important it is to have funding for legal service agencies so that they can continue to help ensure other people, other families safety. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Fountain, and thank you for sharing your story and indeed Sharing your story does help and assist. So thank you very much for coming forward. Any questions of Ms. Bouton? Ms. Halperin. Hello, thank you to the Chief Judge and the Permanent Commission on Access to Justice for holding this hearing. Thank you, Ms. Bouton, for your courage and sharing your experience with us so that we can highlight the importance of civil legal services and helping families stay safe and free from violence and abuse. I would also like to recognize your fearless attorney, Adrian Thiel, who works tirelessly on behalf of survivors of domestic violence and their families in Ulster County to ensure access to justice and safety. Her commitment and tenacity to her clients and this work enable survivors to continue to achieve stability despite a global pandemic and other seemingly insurmountable odds. This work was even more essential during the pandemic when survivors of domestic violence were forced to shelter in place with abusers. This horrific byproduct of the pandemic let, left victims completely isolated from any supports they may have established through employment, religious institutions, their children's schools, or medical providers. Quarantining at home with an abuser prevented victims from being able to confidentially access legal and other supportive services. With courts physically closed, Victims seeking legal relief were not always sure how to access orders of protection, modifications of custody and visitation orders, or child support necessary to keep themselves and their families safe. With limited opportunity to leave their homes during the pandemic, victims' ability to access supportive services, including civil legal aid, were limited. The pandemic made one thing crystal clear. Families living in poverty in our region who were often communities of color, suffered disproportionately because of inequities in access to healthcare, technology, education, and other resources. Indeed, justice is also a resource that low-income and vulnerable communities are too often unable to access without the assistance of civil legal aid. During the pandemic, our neighbors who could not access justice experienced devastating consequences including homelessness, living in apartments in disrepair, foregoing important medical care, and having to choose between feeding their children and paying their other bills. These inequities underscore the important role that civil legal aid played during the pandemic and how it can be transformative in maintaining vulnerable communities' health, 
well-being, and safety. Legal Services of the Hudson Valley is the sole provider in the Hudson Valley of free, comprehensive legal services in civil matters for individuals and families who cannot afford an attorney when their basic human needs are at stake. In 2020 alone, Legal Services of the Hudson Valley handled over 12,000 cases affecting over 27,000 people. Nearly 3,000 cases were for seniors. Over 3,000 cases were for victims of domestic violence, and nearly 1,000 were for veterans and military families. At the same time, LSHV was unable to serve nearly 3,000 people who were looking for assistance. Lack of access to civil legal services is a public health crisis. Recent data shows that communities with the highest eviction rates also have the lowest vaccination rates. Access to civil legal aid continues to be a lifeline for people facing the loss of basic necessities to help mitigate the destruction the pandemic inflicted on marginalized communities. Legal aid keeps our neighbors healthy and thriving and plays a transformative role in people's lives. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today to highlight the essential role of civil legal aid and access to justice. Thank you. Any questions for Ms. Halpern? Well, if I could, Chief? Yes, of course. Yes. Justice Whalen. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to um, commend Counsel Thiel for her representation in this case. Um, I'm sure it is one of many, many cases that you've handled um, that is uh, uh, you know, incredibly dramatic and no doubt incredibly emotional. And so I commend you on your fine work here. Um, I, I wanted to ask though, uh, Ms. Helper, a question. With respect to the 3,000 people you noted who were unable to, um, you were unable to serve in 2020, um, two questions really. Is there a triage that takes place in terms of how you decide how, you know, who you don't serve? And could you talk to us a little bit about that? And then secondly, um, are those numbers holding, or are you aware yet, are those numbers holding uh, for this year? In other words, are we going to faced with the same dilemma this year as we were last year, or is it easing or getting worse? All, all great questions. Yes, we often describe our practice as a legal triage. Um, so clients will come in, will perform a full comprehensive legal assessment, we call like a legal checkup, to spot any uh, civil legal issues they may be encountering. And then we have to prioritize. Uh, we try to give everybody at least some advice if we're not able to fully represent them. Uh, but we prioritize based on factors uh, like protected housing. If we know protected housing is so limited and such a valuable asset in our communities that, you know, we'll prioritize um, protecting uh, subsidized housing. So public housing, Section 8 and other uh, subsidized housing. So, yes, uh, we, are, we, do, we do a triage and we have to prioritize uh, based on our limited resources. Um, last year, actually... Um, those, the 12,000 people that we served was low for us. We did, we did see a slight decline during 2020. Um, on an average year, we serve usually over 15,000 cases. Um, and we see those numbers in 2021 going up, um, certainly. And we anticipate the um, unmet need to, to grow as well along, along with those numbers. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Halpern, and thank you for your strong leadership uh, already at Legal Services of Hudson Valley. And Ms. Thiel, thank you for your work up in Ulster. We very much appreciate it, particularly your assistance during the pandemic and during the quarantining stages of the pandemic. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good luck to you, Ms. Boughton. Thank you. Okay, we need to find Mr. What time? Okay. okay. 
Mr. Watawa. So I just spoke to Maria, who is our um, office manager, and she said that Mr. Watala needs to be um, added as a presenter. That is what we're attempting to do. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Thank you. We appreciate it. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Is there Thank anything you. we should communicate to Maria, the office manager? Uh, no, I think that once he's up, she'll... I'll call her and make sure she turns on his video. I'm sorry, Brian? He's there. It's just not coming in. Can we hear him? Can we get audio on him? Uh, I'll take care of it. Mr. Watala, can you hear us? So she said that they can hear everything, and for her, there's it's showing that the camera is on, so they're just troubleshooting right now. Okay. Sorry. No, not a problem. You want to have him disconnect and try to reconnect again? No, no. Oh. I think she went to get him. Mm. Oh, wait, he's coming in. Hang on. Have him turn. There we go. There we go. Excellent. There we go. Excellent. Yay. <laughs> so to come back. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. We'll wait for your colleague to come back on the screen. There she is. Okay. Good afternoon. <coughs> Our next client presenter is Henry Watala, who was represented by Sarah Kupferberg of Nassau Suffolk Legal Law Services. And they're joined today by Victoria Ost the executive director of Nassau Suffolk Law Services. Thank you, Mr. Watala. We're looking forward to hearing from you, sir. Thank you. My name is Henry Watala. I'm a client of Nassau Suffolk Law Services. Law Services worked hard on my behalf to ensure that I received my Social Security retirement benefits. I was born in a refugee camp in Augsburg, Germany, after the end of World War II. Both of my parents were Polish citizens that had been brought to Germany to provide forced labor during the war. After the war, Poland refused to, re to allow our family to return. Luckily, when I was just an infant, my family and I were able to emigrate to the United States of America as displaced people. America is the only home that I have ever known. When I was seven years old, both my parents became U.S. citizens, and the lawyers told us that because I was a minor, I also obtained my citizenship that day. It was an exciting day to finally to be able to claim citizenship in the country that I love. And from that day forward, I never questioned whether I belonged in this country. As an adult, I've always been an active member in my community. From 1970 to 1985, I was a volunteer firefighter at the Hempstead Volunteer Fire Department. Additionally, I raised four stepchildren and worked for over 35 years. Throughout my career, I paid into the social security system. In 1980, my brother and I opened a print shop in Queens, uh, New York, we ran the business together for 25 years before the changing eco economy caused, the, caused us to close our doors in 2007. Once the print shop closed, I began working at Macy's, Oakfield Mall, 
<clears throat> Unfortunately, in 2011, I was diagnosed with an aortic occlusion. That's a blockage of my aortic artery. I had invasive surgery and flatlined on the operating table twice. I spent a month in the hospital recovering from my surgery. Once I recovered, I went back to work at Macy's and worked until 2017. Due to my failing health, I took too many sick days and I was fired from my position. By that time, I was 67 years old, so I decided to file for Social Security retirement benefits. Imagine my surprise when I was denied for failure to provide to prove my citizenship. I had provided all my paperwork from the time I was born until my parents' naturalization, and still the local office refused to process my claim. I tried to advocate for myself. I called Social Security, but could not determine how to fix the issue. I went to my local Social Security office on several occasions. Each time, a different worker spoke to me. Each worker provided me with different and conflicting information. I was ultimately told to be patient. None of the workers were able to advise me on how to get my benefits started. After a year and a half without any income, I spent my entire retirement savings. As a result, in 2019, I ended up homeless. I went to the Nassau County Department of Social Services for help. DSS placed me in a shelter and gave me SNAP benefits and $277 in cash benefits monthly. Needless to say, it was very tough to make ends meet with such a limited budget. At the end of 2019, I received a notice from the Social Security Administration that even my Medicare benefits had been cut off. <clears throat> By this point, I was feeling helpless and I knew that I needed legal representation. In late February 2020, a friend of mine referred me to the Nassau Suffolk Law Services Community Legal Help Project. I walked into one of their library outreach days and explained my issue. The staff was very friendly and helpful. They advised me that I would be referred to an attorney for further assistance. Shortly thereafter, I received a call from Ms. Sarah in the Disability Advocacy Pro Project Unit. Ms. Sarah, began, <clears throat> Ms. Sarah began advocating on my behalf right away. She was able to determine which documents were required and we made a plan on how to proceed. We decided that I would request a passport to prove my citizenship. Ms. Sarah helped me collect all the required paperwork and fill out the passport application. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 pandemic hit before I could submit my passport application. The pandemic, along with my ill health, prevented me from getting passport pictures and submitting an application. Processing times for all federal applications were also extended. When Ms. Sarah saw that our plan wasn't going to work, she changed her tactics and com continued to fight for me. <clears throat> Finally, in 2000, July 2021, I began receiving my monthly retirement benefits. In addition, I was awarded almost $50,000 in retroactive benefits. This money has given me hope for the future. I'm looking forward to finally be able to enjoy my entire retirement. Without the help of Ms. Sarah and Nassau Suffolk Law Services, I'm certain I would not have been able to get my retirement benefits. I'm incredibly grateful for the important work done that they, for the important work that they have, that they do helping people that are struggling to navigate the legal system. Thank you, Mr. Watala. Mr. Watala, if I could be so bold as to ask you this, what was the plan for you had you not been in a position with the assistance of your lawyer to secure your rightful benefits? I'm, I'm sorry, I really can't hear. I have no volume here at all on the speakers. Can you hear me now? There you go, that's better. Okay, so what was the plan, sir, had you not been able to secure your rightful benefits? What I, I, I didn't have a plan. I had no plan whatsoever, just a lot of hope and then and, and no hope. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I missed how you were connected with your lawyer. Uh, what brought you two together? How did you learn of the availability of those services? There was a, uh, they were at the Uniondale Public Library. Mm -hmm. And I walked in and told them my problem and I had, uh, they, they recommended me to Miss Sarah and, and here I am. Excellent, thank you, thank you, sir. And thank you for coming forward and sharing your story. Ms. Oz. Thank you for helping me. Oh, Thank you. You're very welcome, sir. Ms. Oz. Thank you. Um, my name is Victoria Osk, and I am the executive director of Nassau Suffolk Law Services. I would like to thank Mr. Watala for sharing his experience with us. And I would also like to express my gratitude for this opportunity to address this panel today. As the largest provider of free civil legal services on Long Island, <clears throat> and the only organization to provide comprehensive legal services in our region. 
Our office has worked diligently to provide effective legal assistance to marginalized communities who have experienced disparate impact due to the COVID-19 pandemic. In order to ensure that our clients continue to receive the best service, staff returned to our office in a hybrid setting in July 2020. Prior to that, a small number of staff would enter the office on a limited basis pursuant to the emergency orders in effect at that time. Many of our elderly clients and our clients with disabilities found it difficult or impossible to meet remotely using technology. To help cope with these accessibility issues, many of our staff met with clients in public areas such as supermarket parking lots or other outdoor areas such as a park. However, our clients found it extremely difficult to obtain access to the public agencies and supportive services upon which the elderly and disabled must often rely. They also confronted great medical risk if they did enter a public office or take public transport. Many of our clients face desperate circumstances in obtaining basic necessities. In the struggle to assist them, the JCLS has been a critical support providing resources in a time of almost unprecedented emergency. Law Services has approximately 40 attorneys to address the legal needs of the entire low-income population on Long Island, with an eligible population of 396,000 people. While this is barely adequate, it would be much less without the support we received from New York State. The population of people facing eviction and homelessness, those dependent on public benefits, people living with mental and physical disabilities, senior citizens, and other vulnerable persons have been facing significant new barriers to their survival. Mr. Watala's case is a perfect example of this. Mr. Watala came in to request services to the Community Legal Help Project, a joint project with the Suffolk County Access to Justice Committee bringing together legal services providers and volunteers through public libraries to provide legal advice and assistance to low-income residents in a community setting. Once referred to our staff attorney, Sarah Kupferberg, we were able to obtain benefits for this client. However, this case shows that in addition to the barriers usually faced by low-income, elderly, and disabled persons, the pandemic created new barriers which would have been insurmountable without legal representation. First, Sarah and Mr. Mutala attempted to obtain a passport to satisfy Social Security, but this was frustrated by new and extreme delays in the issuance of federal documentation, such as passports and certificates of citizenship, as well as the danger associated with even entering the office. By the time it became clear that a passport was not readily obtainable, Social Security had closed its offices to the public as they remain, and reaching SSA by phone was increasingly difficult. Sarah was forced to formally submit a brief arguing that Social Security must accept secondary proof of citizenship when primary proof is unavailable. When this argument was successful, she was able to gain gather materials such as certified copies of his deceased parents' certificates of citizenship, as well as his birth certificate, his baptismal certificate, and his parents' marriage certificate, all of which had to be translated from German into English. When this had been done, Sarah sought to submit them to Social Security, but was denied an in-person meeting to do so until she successfully argued that one should be made available based on a recent internal emergency message within the Social Security system, authorizing some in-person meetings in dire need cases. Elderly, disabled, homeless, and without income, Mr. Watala met the definition of dire need, and Sarah was granted a meeting to submit these precious documents. Finally, his retirement benefits that he had worked for all his life have been granted, and he can look forward to some stability in his retirement years. While this story has a happy ending, it illustrates how many of the critical transactions, which sound so simple, can create insurmountable barriers to the poor and vulnerable. Additionally, the pandemic exacerbated those barriers to such a degree that even an attorney struggled to overcome them. 
without the intervention of a legal services attorney and her active and highly technical representation, there is no reason to believe that Mr. Watala would have received the fruits of his years of labor. It is these critical and sometimes even desperate needs that your support enables us to effectively address. On behalf of the dedicated staff of Nassau Suffolk Law Services and the clients they serve, I thank you for this support. And on behalf of all of us, you're welcome. And Ms. Kupfenberg, Ms. Sarah, as Mr. Wittala was calling you, thank you for your literally life-changing representation. Good luck to you, Mr. Wittala. Thank you. Ms. Duval, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, we're just trying to connect uh, the lawyers. We're good to go? Yep. Okay, great. Good afternoon, uh, Ms. Duval. This next speaker is Janice Duval. She is a client of the Legal Aid Society of Rochester, and she's joined by her lawyer, Mark Moyo, the, direct, the program director of the housing. <laughs> and Consumer Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society of Rochester. Thank you, Ms. Duval. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Good afternoon, my name is Janice Duval. I'm 65 years old and I live at Andrew Terrace apartment at 125 St. Paul Street, downtown Rochester. The building houses elderly residents and people with disabilities. I've been living there for five years. Early in the COVID-19 pandemic, I fell behind in my rent and I became ill and was hospitalized. In addition, because of my because of my condition, I suffered rheumatoid, I suffered rheumatoid arthritis and keeps my wheelchair, I'm wheelchair bound. Um, I have spent a lot of, a lot more money. I have to spend a lot more money on personal items than most people for personal health products. Finally, um, three members of my family passed due to the coronavirus and I felt obligated, I felt I'm sorry. Take your time, ma'am. I fell behind in paying my rent, uh, preparing for funerals. Well, a lot of money went toward the funerals expenses. Um, in November 2020, I received the notice that I had to go to city court for eviction notices because of the unpaid rent. I had tried to keep, I had tried to take care of the rent on my own, but it failed. But I never could work out a payment plan where I could, where I could pay the money. I did a call, I did a call to 211 and started the process of getting help with any means before the court date. 
When I arrived at court, I had no representation. The legal aid was there and I worried about being homeless and being forced to, to move out with no shelter or worse. I was told that I, I, I told to ask to speak to legal aid attorney who was outside the courtroom. I spoke with the attorney and she told me that she would represent me as an attorney for legal aid. Because at that time I had no attorney at all when I got to the courtroom. So she had to, she had to uh, judge, um, adjourn until she could find me some rental assistance. On the next court date, I did not have to appear because my attorney appeared for me. Mm. This was a great relief because my health was deteriorating. During this time in December, I had contacted coronavirus and became greatly ill and, and was hospitalized. About a week after being released from the hospital, I suffered a stroke. I had to be hospitalized again. I'm still doing rehabilitation from the stroke. The, the experience affected me, the stroke effect affected me really bad. And not only that, the coronavirus, recovering from the coronavirus had me set back a bit because it took almost like a month to just stop having the symptoms from the coronavirus, the tiredness and stuff. But anyways, I received, then they put me on oxygen to keep me healthy. During the short adjournment, my attorney worked diligently with me to, with good people at person, the good people at the center housing option of Rochester, based homeless prevention nonprofit organization. They helped me pay most of the back rent, which was the, with the it's called the PCHO. They paid like $1,900 toward my back rent. And then, but even that wasn't still in it, wasn't enough. And then Tell me, and then legal aid stepped in after representing me in court and called me one evening and told me, Mrs. Duval, we've got the extra money you need. And I was overwhelmed. They paid 850, the rent was $858. They ended up paying $800 for me and asked me did I have the other $58. I was swept off my feet. I began to breathe again and want to fight to continue to live because I don't know what I would have done had not legal aid stepped up with the grant money that they had helped me with, facing my eviction and the legal aid could pay up to $800 of my back rent, I would have paid the remaining of $58, which, was, I was, which I was thankful for. But since I've been able to keep the balance up on my rent and I'm just telling you, I'm just so, I, I'm just so grateful to the assistance that, they, that was given to Legal Aid to help me because I was lost, I was homeless, I couldn't walk. It was all, I can't even pronounce the words. I lost so many people during the, during the epidemic. And now, right now, as I speak to you, I have a brother who was one year older than me that just went on life support with the COVID virus and pneumonia. So I'm hoping when I leave out of this office, 
that some, somebody else will hear this cry that I have and hear this story and some more people can be helped. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ball, and thank you for communicating uh, such an accurate and detailed description of your case, your circumstances, the impact on you, and the impact of the legal services assistance that you received. And I think your story, ma'am, will stand as support and affirmation for why funding civil legal services is so very important for all of us across the state. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Ms. Thank you. You're very welcome, ma'am, and good luck to you. Mr. Moyo? <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Moyo. I am the program director of the Housing and Consumer Law Unit at the Legal Aid Society of Rochester in Rochester, New York. I have been a housing attorney at the Legal Aid Society for almost 12 years and have been a supervisor for three years. Uh, I'm grateful to be a part of today's important proceedings, and I would be happy to answer any questions you might have after my remarks. The COVID pandemic and the responses to it have created some of our most difficult circumstances as tenant defense attorneys. But in some ways, the opportunities from the pandemic have given us what we've been asking for for many years. Um, first, I'll talk about the good. In Monroe County, before the pandemic, the legal services community, local government officials, uh, and under our Local Justice for All initiative, had been working on a plan to create an access to counsel program for all Rochester tenants facing eviction, as well as for tenants in the largest sub suburban communities one thing we were missing at that point uh, was funding. And so uh, the pandemic uh, federal aid came in and helped us with that. Rochester has one of the highest per capita rates of eviction filing in the whole of New York State. It's higher than New York City. And we have a higher total number of eviction filings than Buffalo, which has a population 25% larger than Rochester. 64% uh, of households in the city of Rochester are renters with a median monthly rent of approximately $780. The median tenant household <laughs> annual income, that's okay, is $22,000. If you do the math, this leaves many tenants paying more than 30% of their income in rent and many more, or many people paying approximately 50% of their income in rent. When pandemic aid came from the federal and state government, we were, were able to sex, su successfully implement the access to counsel program that we had been working on for more than two years. The Legal Aid Society partnered with Legal Assistance of Western New York and Just Cause, which was previously known as Volunteer Legal Services Project of Monroe County, to staff up with new attorneys and support staff so we could meet the coming demand. To date, we have been able to represent every person in Monroe County who is seeking representation in a residential eviction matter. We owe a special thank you to the local court administration in the 7th Judicial District for working with our organizations to make the local access to counsel program as a success. The program uh, was a piece and was aided by the establishment in August 2020 of the innovative special COVID intervention part, which we call SKIP. SKIP creates a one-stop shop in the courthouse where tenants can meet with representatives from the Monroe County Department of Human Services and other social service organizations, as well as legal service providers to address their urgent eviction matters. In addition, SKIP consolidated eviction cases from the town and village courts into one county court part in the Hall of Justice in downtown Rochester. Having representatives from social service agencies available right outside the courtroom has been instrumental in terms of assisting clients in applying for rental assistance or checking on the status of a pending application. Further, the consolidation of cases in one location allows our partners to represent any tenant seeking assistance regardless of where they live in the county. Without this initiative, the logistics and cost of offering representation to everyone in the county would have been daunting. Additionally, the rental assistance funds that have been set up to help pay past due rent have been invaluable. Previously in Rochester, like many other areas of upstate, public rental assistance funds were not readily available, even for vulnerable tenants like Mr. Ball. Tenants had to rely on the limited charitable funds available from not-for-profit organizations and from generous donors, uh, similar to how we helped Ms. Duvall pay her $800. In a post-pandemic New York State, I strongly urge the continuation of public rental assistance to help people avoid eviction and all of the social ills that follow from eviction. 
While I'm proud of Legal Aid and our partners that we've been able to represent so many people facing eviction during the pandemic, holding court in person for significant periods during the pandemic has been detrimental at times to our staff and to our clients. Prior to the pandemic, approximately 8,600 eviction cases were filed annually in Rochester City Court, and the court would hear up to 40 eviction cases per day. For most of the pandemic, that has remained true. The cases were just split into morning and afternoon sessions of 20 cases each. At the start of the pandemic, there were almost no cases being heard. Beginning in September 2020, cases uh, were mainly heard in person on a daily basis. During much of this time, while there was no eviction moratorium in place, individuals were being evicted from their homes in Rochester. When cases rose dramatically in December 2020, attorneys and their clients were permitted to appear virtually. Since March 15th of 2021, the court has gone back to mainly in-person appearances. As a supervisor of staff of 12, including attorneys and support staff, I felt very anxious at the beginning about sending colleagues to court who were, who were not able to be vaccinated at that point. Now, I am concerned again for my staff, as well as for my clients, many of whom have health conditions and disabilities as the number of COVID cases continue to rise. I wanna restate that I'm very proud of what we've accomplished in Monroe County. I think our access to council program is as, is as successful as any I have seen reported anywhere in the nation. That success is a testament to the dedicated attorneys and staff at the Legal Aid, Law New York and Just Cause, to our governmental partners at the city and county level and to the local court administrators. We must be able to continue this important work. In order to do so, it's imperative that our federal, state and local gov governments find a way to increase funding for legal services and provide continued rental assistance programs beyond the pandemic. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Moyo. Any questions? Well, congratulations, congratulations to you, sir, on your successes. And we thank you for your work, not only to the larger community, but your service to Ms. Duval. Just such a poignant recitation and example of how you, your services helped a woman regain her stability. So we thank you for that. Thank, thank you, you very much. And good luck to you in your service to your community. Thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Okay. Yeah, because that's Adrian. Yeah. You skipped okay. the next one, so. Uh, this is Aaron Morris and Adrian Holder. Uh, let's see. Miss uh, uh, Aaron Morris is a client of the Legal Aid Society, accompanied by his attorney, Susan Horwitz. They are joined by Adrian Holder, who we all know, the attorney in charge of the Civil Practice Division of the Legal Aid Society. I don't see Mr. Morris on the screen. Yeah, so I think I think that you skipped us. Uh, Aaron might be confused about the order because I think there was another client there panel. There was, but we needed to skip to you. So okay, are that's we fine. Able to so, I'm sure, because he was he was on. Susan, do you okay, think you can? I'll call him. I'll call him. Okay. I'm sure um, he he came in from school and he logged in, so we <laughs> so he's available. But maybe he just thought he had a little bit more time. Okay, we'll wait a moment for him, of course. 
Thank you, Judge. You're welcome. There he goes. Sorry. It's okay, Aaron. They skipped they skipped a group, so we know it's just early. Aaron, welcome to Court of Appeals Hall. We are anxious to hear your presentation today. So we're gonna to get to you straight away. Please proceed. Ma'am, I can't really hear you. I said to you, welcome to Court of Appeals Hall. We are very anxious to hear your presentation today, interested in what you have to say to us. You have the floor, yeah. sir. Yes, ma'am. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Aaron Morris. Since February 2020, I live with my parents in a Brooklyn shelter. Currently, I am a sophomore at the High School for Youth and Community Development in Brooklyn. Before the pandemic closed down schools, I was in the eighth grade at a school across the street from my shelter. I liked school. I got good grades and had friends. In September of 2020, I started the ninth grade and went to school remotely since the pandemic started because my father had medical conditions that made any COVID exposure risky. When this pandemic started, I was shocked and confused because this is the first time I've ever been through anything like this. In addition, maintaining remote access to school was challenging. At first, I had a school laptop that I tried to use to get online for remote learning, but since the shelter didn't have Wi-Fi for the residents, the only way I could connect was through the hotspot on my father's cellular phone. The connection wasn't reliable, and even when I could get online for school, we ran out of cellular data quickly. In April of 2020, I got an iPad with a T-Mobile cell service, but it barely worked because the signal was not strong. The iPad had some of the same problems connecting that I had already experienced with the hotspot. My father and I had to go up to the school several times to meet outside with the school's technology specialist to get internet working on my iPad. Eventually, the iPad stopped working altogether and started crashing. I wasn't able to get any of my assignments in on time or stay in any of my classes without being logged out. And eventually, I missed most of my classes. I felt angry and ashamed of that the City Department of Education not doing their job to provide every kid with a working iPad. It was especially hard because when I started the ninth grade, I hadn't met any of my teachers or classmates in person. The only way I could interact with them was on screen. Not being able to connect with them online made me depressed and stop, even stopped trying to log in many days. Around October of 2020, after I met with the attorneys and advocates at the Legal Aid Society. Their team got me an iPad from my school with a Verizon cell plan. It wasn't perfect, but it connected more reliably than the first iPad they gave. I was able to log into my classes more often and submit homework assignments. When my father and I first talked to the Legal Aid team, we told them about all the other students living in our shelter who couldn't connect to the internet. Legal Aid told us that the problem was not just in our building. There were students in many shelters all over the city who were having the same problems connecting and keeping up with their education. Legal Aid asked if we'd be a part of a lawsuit that makes, that will require the city to install Wi-Fi for all the shelters. We know a lot of the other students in our shelter who were having the same problem, so we were excited to help. My father and I were interviewed by reporters and appeared on TV. I had to be questioned by the city's lawyers about how the internet problems affected my education. It was hard talking about what it was like living in a shelter and trying to go to school remotely. But my father and I knew how important it was to get other kids in the shelter the same thing Legal Aid helped me get. Access to the internet so that they could get an education during this pandemic. So the Legal Aid Society didn't just help the Morris family, they helped thousands of other students get an education during this pandemic. In December of 2020, my shelter was finally wired for internet access. It still took some time to get the connection working well, but after that, my grades skyrocketed from a C average to an A average. Being able to fully participate in remote school helped me feel better about myself during this really hard time. I heard almost all the family shelters now have Wi-Fi, and I'm proud that my father and I were able to help legally make this happen. I wish that it had happened sooner so other students like me 
wouldn't have had missed as much school. Legal Aid didn't just help me with getting internet access. When I told some of the lawyers that I was interested in engineering, they sent me information about a summer internship at the Cooper Union for high school students. I applied and was accepted with a full scholarship. Wow. And I studied architectural engineering and mechanical engineering this summer. If it hadn't been for Legal Aid, I would have never known about this opportunity. Legal Aid provides essential service for, and advocates for New Yorkers. And I've been told that as much as Legal Aid does would not be possible without the consistent investments of the judiciary civil legal services funding since 2011. Thank you so much for my invita this invitation to appear on, to you today and share my story. Your parents and your entire extended community must be so proud of you. And while you talk about the long haul, your patience and your persistence make you a true trailblazer. And I'm a little disappointed to hear you're going into engineering because I'm thinking as you're talking one day, this guy's gonna take my chair. <laughs> Congratulations, on it. young man, and good luck to you. Anyone have any questions? Justice LaSalle. Mr. Morris, I was really moved by your story. I've heard a lot of stories in all my years in people's, uh, as, a, as a judge and as a prosecutor, but, and I rarely get moved, but you really moved me. Um, how did that, that internship work this summer, the, uh, the, the thing you did at Cooper Union? You want to fill us in on that? Uh, if we have the time, Chief. Yes, yes, of course we have the time for the show. It, it was great. I just wish that it had never ended because I was having a lot of fun with it. And I learned how to make 3D models of whatever I was trying to create. And most of my ideas, I was able to make a 3D model out of it. And my father and I were actually thinking about doing like a business of our own one day where everything in the store is under a dollar. Like it was like a candy, a candy store and it was, everything was under a dollar. So for my dad, I made like a 3D model of a building with this sign on top of the building. And the sign was actually rotating on top of the building. So that was a kind of fun project that I did with the 3D modeling during the um, summer internship. Thank you so very much. Ms. Holder, your testimony is almost not needed. This young man is the personification of the great work that the Legal Aid Society is doing. We're going to let you present, but it's almost unnecessary. To, a terrific story, Aaron. Good luck to you from all of us. Ms. Holder. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, Aaron, stay on. Aaron is terrific, isn't he? I, I just have to say, um, I'm so pleased. Um, Aaron's family has been working with Susan Horowitz, and I want to give her my thanks as well. Um, she's, the, she's actually the director of our education law unit um, that worked on a case that I'm about to talk about um, around Wi-Fi in the shelter system. And Catherine Cliff is also a, um, one of the attorneys in our homeless rights unit has been working with Aaron. But Aaron has impressed me in the short amount of time that I've known him. And Judge, we're going to work on him on law. But right now, engineering is what he has a passion for, and we're going to go with that. So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Adrian Holder, attorney in charge of the Civil Practice of the Legal Aid Society. And I first want to thank Honorable Chief Judge Janet DeFior, Honorable Judge Rolando Diacosta, um, Honorable Judge Hector LaSalle, Honorable Judge um, Elizabeth uh, Gary, Honorable jo Judge uh, Gerald Whalen, Honorable Chief Administrative Judge um, Lawrence Marks, and New York State Bar President uh, Andrew Brown uh, for the opportunity to address you today. Um, as you can tell, Aaron Morris's experience illustrates that the digital divide is real and that the inevitable access to broadband and appropriate equipment for our children has long lasting consequences. At the end of November 2020, the Legal Aid Society with Millbank filed a lawsuit on behalf of the Coalition for the Homeless and certain individual shelter residents and their children against the city for failing to provide students residing in city shelters with access to reliable internet service, thus often leaving students unable to access school remotely during the pandemic. Every school year, there are approximately 100,000 public school students experiencing homelessness in New York City. When schools closed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, 
Day in March of 2020. The Department of Education provided cellular data enabled devices for students, but many shelters were located in areas without adequate or reliable cellular data services. This effectively prevented many students residing in shelters from being able to access school, complete homework assignments, and communicate with their teachers. Despite frequent communication and advocacy, the city failed to correct the situation, ultimately leaving 11,000 students in over 200 shelters unable to participate reliably in remote education. In April 2021, we secured a settlement with the city, which requires the city to substantially complete installation of wireless internet by August 31st of 2021. In addition, the city was required to institute a range of interim measures and in support to ensure children housed in shelters had adequate remote education educational access. These include established timeframes for the City Department of Education to resolve any technical issues related to internet access via tablets and requirements for shelter providers to provide information to shelter residents about this dedicated help desk and technical support. We're pleased to report that as of August 31st, every existing shelter unit that houses children is wired for internet and every new building site will also include internet access. Throughout the pandemic, the Legal Aid Society continued to press for the needs of low-income students. We assisted our clients in securing iPads, laptops, Chromebooks, and internet access where needed, participated in special education meetings and impartial hearings, and counseled parents on their children's rights to continued special education services. We continued our advocacy to ensure that students with disabilities receive special education services via individualized education plans, also known as IEPs, while schools were closed as well as during the summer to avoid education, educational regression caused by the abrupt end of in-school instruction. We are currently advocating for a remote instruction option for medically vulnerable students and for students living with vulnerable household members for whom COVID exposure is an enormous risk to health. As we continue to move through the many stages of this crisis, we remain on the front line of efforts to ensure that the needs of New York's marginalized communities are met. So much of this would not have been possible without the consistent investment of judiciary civil legal services funding since 2011. Investing in legal services is a long-term investment in the fight against racism, injustice, and poverty. And so on behalf of the Legal Aid Society, I thank you for your continued support. And again, for the invitation to share a part of our work today. I'm so glad that you had an opportunity to meet Aaron. Thank you, Ms. Holder, and we're happy to have had the opportunity to meet Aaron as well. And Ms. Horowitz, these are the reasons why we go to law school. And congratulations on your impactful representation of this young man and the thousands of other students similarly situated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent. Our next client presenter is Kenya Bemis, and she is accompanied by her lawyer, Anthony Moen, a senior attorney at the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York. Ms. Bemis, welcome to you. Thank you. Please, you may um, proceed. It's okay. It's good to be here. My name is Kenya Bemis, uh, and I'm here to share my story as a client of the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York. Um, I currently teach high school biology with um, Schenectady City Schools. Um, I also work with the Liberty Partnership Program as a tutor during the school year and during the summers. And I am an instructor during the summers for their STEAM camp. Um, so science, technology, engineering, art, um, math camp for a local high-risk um, high middle schoolers. I received two master's degrees from SUNY Albany, one in biological anthropology and the other in education. And I currently live in Latham with my husband and seven-year-old daughter. 
So in the spring of 2020, I shifted to teaching remotely after the pandemic began and continued full-time with the school district and began talking with the Liberty Partnership Program about plans for the summer. In early June, I was informed that due to fu a funding crisis because of uh, funding cuts and COVID restrictions, the Liberty Partnership Program would not be able to um, offer me my normal summer employment. Um, I count on that additional income from LPP since um, teaching high school only provides me with income for my family for 10 months of each year. And so without it, I began to worry about supporting my family and paying rent and other important bills. Um, around the same time, my teachers union sent out an email explaining that if um, your regular summer employment is impacted due to COVID, you may qualify for the PUA. I applied to the Department of Labor, was approved, and then began to receive pandemic unemployment benefits. In midsummer, I returned to work at school for a few days for professional development, creating a break in my claim. I had to recertify my claim for benefits, but when I did so, the Department of Labor rescinded their approval of my PUA and stopped receiving benefits. In, 20, in October 2020, I received a notice from the Department of Labor that they were charging me an overpayment of $4,038, which I had to pay back. Um, after I received the overpayment notice, I contacted the Legal Aid uh, Society of Northeastern New York and was connected with attorney Anthony Mohan. He confirmed um, that I was el indeed eligible for the PUA and based on the loss of my summer employment, we, we requested a hearing. Um, that hearing was finally held in April 2021. Um, with Anthony's support, I testified about how uncertain everything was in 2020, and we received a favorable decision stating that I was entitled to collect benefits, so there was no overpayment. Um, we were also able to qualify me for the remaining weeks of summer 2020, and I received an additional $504 in retroactive benefits. Um, COVID has been very difficult to navigate for teachers um, between adjusting to remote and hybrid teaching environments and um, deepening funding cuts. Many of us were unsure about the future of our careers. Um, in my school district, in Schenectady City School Districts, more than 100 teachers, um, social workers, and school counselors, and over 200 paraprofessionals were laid off in September 2020 due to anticipated cuts in state aid funding. Um, I, along with many other teachers and other educational professionals, did not know 100% if we were returning in the fall when the news about the budget was discussed during the latter part of the summer. So in normal years, um, teachers can make other arrangements through part-time and seasonal jobs to make ends meet to cover the two months we have when we're without income and understand that employment benefits are not um, available during that time. During COVID, regular summer employment was interrupted, causing concern and a lot of stress. I'm one of the lucky ones. My union provided me with accurate information about um, pandemic-related changes to unemployment benefits. Um, and then when the Department of Labor got it wrong um, and tried to reverse their approval, I found um, the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York. And with the Legal Aid Society of Northeastern New York and Anthony's help, I was able to get a hearing and got a favorable result but many people who work for schools have not. And I am really grateful to Anthony for not only his work on my case, but for his continued work to advocate for continued reexamination of these cases by the Department of Labor and the Unemployment um, Insurance Appeals Board for teachers and other educational professionals across New York State. Um, thank you for helping me fund free legal services, especially COVID-19 when COVID-19 turned everything upside down. 
Thank you, Ms. Bemis. You, you know, we're always concerned, and I may have missed this in your presentation, as to how folks who are in need of civil legal service assistance find their way to their lawyers. I heard you say you found your way to the Legal Aid Society. What pointed mm -hmm. you in that direction? Oh, um, when I got the notice from the Department of Labor, it was embedded in the papers that they gave. They about they, getting yeah. So it was in the instructions from the Department of Labor that that was possible to get representation. Excellent, excellent. I'm glad to hear that. Thank you for sharing your story with us, and we're happy to hear that you seem to be on the right road. So excellent, excellent. Council. Thank you, uh, and thank you, Ms. Bemis, for taking the time to share your story. Thank you, Chief Judge DeFiori, and to all the justices for giving us the opportunity to present here. Ms. Bemis's experience with her claim for pandemic unemployment assistance, or PUA, and the response by the New York State Department of Labor demonstrates the urgent need for civil legal assistance to help New Yorkers meet their basic needs during the pandemic. The COVID-19 pandemic created an unprecedented crisis for people across New York State and across the country. Government was quick to respond at the federal, state, and local levels to declare emergency measures. And in April 2020, Congress passed a law that created a number of programs to address the immediate effects of the pandemic, including pandemic unemployment assistance. This program was designed to expand unemployment protections to a broader range of workers than those normally covered by unemployment insurance. And while its overall aim was clear, Implementing the program created confusion around how to fit it within the existing unemployment benefit rules and regulations in New York. Due to this confusion, many people who were eligible for PUA had to wait months to receive that much needed assistance. And in some instances, PUA recipients were told that they were not eligible for benefits they had already received and they would have to pay them back, sometimes in amounts of thousands of dollars. Teachers and educational employees, such as Ms. Bemis, were one such group of employees who received conflicting information about their claims. Many, like Ms. Bemis, applied and were approved for benefits, which they then relied on to pay their rent, a mortgage, and other bills, only to later be told that they were overpaid benefits and that they had to repay thousands of dollars to the state. Due to the large number of unemployment claims filed during the pandemic, <clears throat> these overpayment notices often went out months after the benefits had been received, and then it took even longer to request a hearing on any overpayment or denial of benefits. This left many unemployed people waiting for months for benefits that they desperately needed or uncertain about whether they would have to repay thousands of dollars that they couldn't afford. Ms. Bemis was fortunate because she called legal aid and had representation in her hearing. And that enabled her to avoid the overpayment and ultimately receive retroactive benefits that she should have gotten in the summer of 2020. But for every client like Ms. Bemis who we serve, there are likely many others who are unable to receive this assistance or accurate information about their claim. Not all parts of New York State had legal services offices that were able to provide representation in unemployment hearings when the pandemic started. And those programs that do provide representation were overwhelmed with requests for assistance as the pandemic wore on. In addition to the increased need for direct representation, the pandemic has shown the need for advocates who can address the systemic impact of these policies. The situation of educational employees is just one example of the difficulty of applying the normal rules for unemployment assurance during the unprecedented circumstances of a global pandemic. A statewide network of advocates, the Unemployment Insurance Coalition, has been critical in distributing information about how to apply for these programs, helping individual clients get their benefits, and speaking out about the failures of the system to serve the basic needs of the most vulnerable New Yorkers. These advocates rely on Judiciary Civil Legal Services funding to help not just their individual clients, but to help make sure that all New Yorkers can meet their basic needs. Without this funding, legal aid would be unable to help clients like Ms. Bemis. This assistance should be expanded to ensure that others like her are not deprived of crucial benefits uh, that they need. And we strive to advocate not just for each of our clients like Ms. Bemis, but to make sure that our work has a broader impact to help others who are similarly affected. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any questions for Mr. Moen? Mr. Moen, um, does the Legal Aid Society have uh, any other clients who are similarly situated to Ms. Bemis? Yes, we, uh, in our Albany office, we helped a number of people who were educational employees, either teachers or paraprofessional employees of school districts, um, in some cases, uh, schoolroom aides, uh, school bus drivers, mm -hmm. and different people who 
we're all similarly affected. And do you track the way in which they wind up uh, in, in your service? We do. As Ms. Bemis said, uh, the Department of Labor fortunately does mail out a list of, uh, of approved advocates who represent claimants in unemployment hearings. And uh, legal services providers are often on there. Um, there are a few private attorneys who are also listed. Uh, so fortunately, um, that information is put into people's hands, although I think in a lot of circumstances, uh, the bigger problem was just having to wait for months and months before they would even get a determination to find out who the appropriate person to contact was. Yes, absolutely. This is a great example of the importance of this work. And we thank you very much, Ms. Bemis. Good luck to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And that concludes uh, this hearing, uh, the 2021 Civil Legal Services hearing. Uh, I thank all of our presenters, both the presenters that joined us here in person, the, presenters, the client presenters who joined us by video along with their lawyers, and of course, I thank my colleagues here on the bench for uh, their interest their devotion and their dedication to increasing access to justice for all New Yorkers. Thank you so very much.